Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to say, in case of a siren, please stay seated. This hall is protected. We can start now. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow space professionals, it is my privilege to moderate the 19th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. As we gather here today, we are reminded of the challenges that our nation faces. The recent Gaza war, which Israel was pulled into by the October 7th event, has left us with deep scars. However, we are a resilient nation and we will not let this tragedy define us. We are the startup nation and we are a space nation. Our heads are in the clouds as we stare to the future. As we move forward, we must remember that our work in space is not just about exploration and discovery. It is about building a better future for all of us. It is about using our knowledge and expertise to solve some of the world's most pressing problems from climate change to healthcare to education. It is about making the world a better place for generations to come. So let us come together today as we celebrate our achievements and look into the future. Let us continue to work towards a brighter tomorrow even in the face of adversity. Let us show the world that although we are at war, we are still the startup nation and a space nation, and we will not deter from our mission to make the world a better place. Before starting the conference, we would like to start in silence for one minute in memory of all the Israelis that were murdered on October 7th, and in the war sense, please stand up for them and for all the babies, children, women, men, and elderly, elderly who are kidnapped and are held in captivity. Their absence is represented here by empty chairs. You may be seated. To commence our conference, we are privileged to receive greetings from the President of the State of Israel, Mr. Yitzhak Herzog. The Honorable Minister of Innovation, Science and Technology, Ophir Akunis, Israel Space Agency Chair, Professor Dan Bloomberg, Director General of the Israel Space Agency, General Ori Aron, leaders of the international space community, and especially the young scientists, students, and dreamers who are here with us today. It is a great pleasure for me to send a few words from the President's residence in Jerusalem as you gather for the 19th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. Dear friends, the theme of this year's conference, Standing Together, Building the Future, highlights an important truth. To build a secure future, we cannot stand alone. Our future, all of our futures, hinge on collaboration, knowledge sharing, and joint purposes. These very days, as we fight to defend ourselves on the battlefield, at the home front, and against the clear axis of evil, and to free each and every one of our hostages, the choice we all face is clear. It is a choice between a path of cooperation collaboration and progress that can ensure a secure future for all humanity or a path of extremism, terror and hatred that will harm every one of us. Over the past years in our region, we watched barriers of hatred dissolve and bridges of cooperation and peace take their place. Space collaboration was one of the many fields where the fruits of collaborations were proven tangible. Through joint space projects, including with partners like the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Morocco, we showed what could be possible when we come together to dream big. 
So dear friends, this is absolutely still true. And I believe that Israel has a great deal to offer, both in our scientific capabilities and in our goodwill. Especially in the field of space, where our contribution to the global arena is hugely disproportionate to our size. Thanks to public-private collaboration, entrepreneurs who think outside the box, and the hard work and commitment to excellence of many of the people here, we're directly affecting life on Earth, and it gives us great hope for the future. Of course, no one embodies the ethos of hard work and excellence of curiosity, courage, and vision more than Ilan Ramon. Ilan's legacy has lived on through this, his wonderful family, Rona of blessed memory, Asaf of blessed memory, Tal, Iftach, and Noah, and through the Ramon Foundation. I salute them, and I salute every one of you who are living this legacy every day. Keep working hard, keep dreaming big. We're all behind you because space is the future of humanity. Thank you, President Herzog. The Israeli Space Agency is a part of the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to invite to the stage Mr. Ophir Akonis, the Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology for the State of Israel. Sir, the stage is yours. Toda Bokertov, Mishpachat Ramon, Aikara, dear Ramon family, Mr. Gadi Arieli, Director General of the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Professor Dan Bloomberg, Chair of Israel Space Agency, and your predecessor, uh, Professor Ben Israel, Shalom Itzik, Mr. Uri Oron, Director of the Israel Space Agency, dear heads of space agencies, ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to welcome you all to the 19th annual Ilan Ramon International Space Conference held by the Israel Space Agency in the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology. Well, this year we are gathering in a totally different atmosphere than previous years. I'm sure some of you have visited the awful sites and seen the horror videos of the barbaric attack on Israel by Hamas ISIS in October 7th. We saw the devil on earth. Well, Israel is fighting the war, but make no mistakes, this war is not only ours. We are only the first front of much larger global war between the democratic free world and the axis of evil led by Iran. The free world will win only if we stand strongly together, united as one. And with your permission, I want to use this opportunity to call on you and your governments to pressure Hamas to release our hostages. Children, women, youngsters, Holocaust survivors, and babies. They are being held in Gaza's terror tunnels and their lives, as you know, are in real danger. My friends, Despite uh, this tragedy, Israel is a strong country, let alone technology and uh, economically speaking. At this time, while we are here dealing with cruel enemies, the Israel Space Week events will focus on the challenges in the tech industry, including the space sector. The, space sector. the high demand for uh, participating in this international conference and the various space events open to the public are a living evidence to the victory of the Israeli spirit. The same spirit which is constantly creating 
and seeks the next, and seeks the next breakthrough. We anticipate that the demand and investment in the Israeli space sector will increase dramatically in the upcoming short time, especially with the Israeli win in the war. We have no intention to stop. We will not stop for a minute the activity, research, and industry of Israel's space tech and innovation sector. Well, it has been 21 years since the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, where we lost the first Israeli astronaut, Lieutenant Colonel Ilan Ramon, rest in peace, and the entire shuttle crew. Ilan and Rona, rest in peace, they taught us that the sky is not the limit. Our highly developed innovative and technological sector is the engine that motivates our economy forward. And I want you to know, head of um, agencies, ambassadors, dear guests, the cabinet just approved a support budget up to one billion shekels for the high tech through the Israel Innovation Authority. This act is a serious boost for the markets and the sector, including, as we talked, Uri, and you remember, the space industry. And the ministry, under my leadership, will continue to implement and create more bilateral and multilateral space agreements with other countries. We always seek to cooperate. Despite the challenging times ahead of us, we will emerge stronger and wiser. We have prevailed over enormous challenges so far, internal and external, and we will succeed this time as well. As, as the president has just said, we are standing together and building the future. In every complex situation, there is opportunity to be found. Thank you for coming this morning. God bless you. God bless our brave soldiers. And remember, the good always prevail the evil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Akunis. We also have a greeting from Mr. Bill Nelson, NASA Administrator. Thank you to the Ramon Foundation, the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, and the Israel Space Agency. Thank you for inviting me to come and join you. Last week, NASA recognized our annual day of remembrance to honor the fallen crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia. And today I remember the life of our dear friend, Ilan Ramon. He was the first Israeli astronaut. He was a pioneer whose legacy will continue to inspire the next generation of explorers, those that will go to the moon and then beyond. One time I was in the office of the former president of Israel, Shimon Peres, and as I was waiting on the office wall, I noticed a, a plaque, and it was like a telex, and it was from Ramon to Shimon Peres. And so when I visited with President Peres, who was out of office at the time, I said, tell me about that. He said, it was the day before the deorbit when the spacecraft was lost. He said, uh, he sent me this, in effect, telex from space. And he said, thank you, Mr. President, for making it possible for me to have this extraordinary experience of looking back at Earth from this perspective, to see our home and our home 
is the planet. Now we are living in a golden era of exploration, one where we're venturing out further into the cosmos than ever before. And over a half century ago, NASA landed on the moon with Apollo. We're gonna go back to the moon, then we're going on to Mars and beyond, and it's the Artemis program. And we go with our international friends and we go with our commercial partners. As a matter of fact, we go with Israel, with whom, of course, the United States has a special relationship. Israel already demonstrated its commitment to Artemis with the contribution of the radiation protection vest on the Artemis I flight, and that launched over a year ago. That was uncrewed to test out the spacecraft. Israel had an experiment on that mission. And on the first private astronaut mission to the low Earth orbit International Space Station, Israeli citizen Eitan Stibbe was part of that crew. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the launch of the third private astronaut mission, and each member of that crew represented a different country and showed the true power of international partnership in space. Israel demonstrated great leadership by signing the Artemis Accords a couple of years ago, and now 34 countries have signed. And it's all for the peaceful exploration of space. So this is an exciting time for space exploration. More and more countries venture out into the cosmos. Israel is at the cutting edge of technology and it will expand humanity's knowledge in space. NASA is excited to partner together on Ultrasat, the Israel Space Agency's first space telescope mission that's gonna share new science about the solar system. And we look forward to Israel joining the US and a handful of other countries with the launch of your second lunar lander, Bear Sheet 2. Together, the United States and Israel are shaping the future of exploration for the Artemis generation. Indeed, for all of humanity. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. As we embark on this intellectual journey, we shall also take a moment to remember and pay our respects to the brave individuals who lost their lives in the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy, and particularly the first Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon. May they, their memory inspire our pursuits and dedication to furthering space exploration. Specialist Ilan Ramon, pilot William McCool, and mission specialist Michael Anderson, David Brown. Three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Houston now controlling.
Mission Control confirms it lost contact. There's been no further communication with the shuttle Columbia. The Columbia's lost. There are no survivors. It is an honor to invite to the stage Tal Ramon, Ilan Ramon's son. Tal will say some words and play his music in memory of his father. father. Thank you all for being here at this very special gathering. My mother was one of the founders of this conference and the Israeli Space Week. She used to say that Asaf and Ilan's smile is our legacy. Her words continue to echo strongly today as they did years ago. 21 years have gone by since my father fulfilled his dream and became the first Israeli astronaut. He taught us to always stride forward, to not be afraid to take risks, and to try to see the potential for doing good and making a positive change in the world. My brother Asaf followed his footsteps and showed us that you can achieve greatness even after enduring such heavy loss. And he showed us this when he graduated with excellence from the Flight Course Academy and Shimon Peres was the one who awarded him his flight wings. This was one of our happiest and proudest moment, moments as our family. To this day, my father's achievements and passion continue to remind us to strive to build a better future, a future that is full of meaning, peace, and equality. He reminds us to see the big picture and that we are all part of something bigger than ourselves. His strong character shines as a beacon of inspiration and hope for all of us. And his endeavor continues to motivate so many people to innovate, develop, and open minds, dream beyond what we can see and perceive. I remember how much he loved and admired his fellow crew members on STS-107. You saw that in the footage. They had such a deep and meaningful connection and they did this, the thing that they loved the most. And they fulfilled their dreams uh, for the better of humankind and for the sake of humanity. When we were in Houston during the astronaut training program, one of our good friends told us that once a country sends their first astronaut into space, it, is a profound, it has a profound impact in the field of science and space when the astronaut returns to their home country. Sadly, my father did not get the chance to see this realization, but my mother, she understood the unique opportunity. 
And so with her strong intuition, the Ramon Foundation was born. The foundation was formed to aid, educate, and maximize the potential of youth, adults, in areas of leadership, science, space, and innovation, bringing people together in the name and inspiration of my brother, Asaf Ramon, and my father, Ilan Ramon. I'm so proud to tell you that because what they have done and what they have accomplished, we continue to see inspired, smiling faces all over our country, even in times like these, when as a nation, we are enduring such sadness and hardship. The foundation keeps giving people hope, keeps bringing people a chance to dream of a better future. And it's amazing to see how much this foundation has grown over the years and how everyone and everything and everybody joins together for this wonderful cause. My mother knew that turning pain into hope would not be an easy task, but my father and brother's memory lit the way for the fulfillment of her vision. This was her way to create a better reality. In many ways, my mother was the one who built the bridge between Israel and a space education. This is probably why she was nicknamed the Space Ambassador of Israel. Um, it's heartwarming to see how the actions of my brother and my parents continue to ripple throughout our society today. They have gone by, and years have gone by, and still, when, children's, when children hear the story of the, Israeli, the first Israeli astronaut, they get filled with, struch, with such uh, strong motivation and pride. And when we look now forward to the years to come, when the next generation will grow up and go after their dreams, no matter in what field, because of their great legacy. Many don't know this, but my father played the piano. His mother, Tonya Wolferman, my grandmother, was a Holocaust survivor and a piano teacher. Over the years, I have played his piano, which he bought with his first paycheck as a pilot. This is how my connection to music was formed, as a cherished reminder of my father knowing that he sat and played the same keys as I do today. I chose to play a piece I composed on his piano called Victoria. It symbolizes victory, a composition that my mother really loved. To rise from hardship and prevail, no matter the circumstances. This is Victoria.
Welcome to the heart of innovation, where the sky is not the limit, but just the beginning. In the dynamic landscape of the Israeli space industry, brilliance and technology converge to redefine the boundaries of exploration. And this is what has helped Israel become the eighth space nation. Meet the brilliant minds shaping the future, engineers and visionaries working tirelessly to propel Israel to the forefront of space exploration. Launching into space, Israel carries the dreams and aspirations of a nation reaching new heights. Collaboration is key. The Israeli space industry thrives on partnerships, bringing together experts from diverse fields to create groundbreaking solutions for imaging satellites, communication satellites, moon landers, and deep space technologies. Beyond the skies, the Israeli space industry, with the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology, and the Israeli Space Agency, champions collaboration with academia, fostering a symbiotic relationship with research and educational institutions. By nurturing the next generation of space pioneers, we ensure that innovation continues to thrive. Our satellites orbiting Earth are more than instruments. They're beacons of progress, providing crucial data for communication, intelligence, research, climate change, precision agriculture, and security. In orbit, on the moon, and in deep space, Israel's space industry is making strides with groundbreaking missions, pushing the boundaries of exploration, and leaving an indelible mark on the cosmos. Witness technological marvels unfold as Israel pioneers advancements in space technology, from cutting-edge satellites through revolutionary propulsion systems to space-verified computers and subsystems. Israel's influence extends beyond borders. Join us as we collaborate with international partners, forging alliances that transcend the boundaries of space. As the sun sets over the horizon, the Israeli space industry continues to illuminate the path towards a future where the sky is not the limit, but only the beginning of infinite possibilities. Join us in leading the next generation to an innovative, technological, and peaceful world. I want to thank again Tal Ramon for your beautiful uh, words and music. And now that we have your full attention, our first talk of the conference will be presented by Mr. Uri Oron, the director of the Israel Space Agency. His, pre his uh, presentation titled The Economic Impact of Israel's Space Industry promises to shed light on the profound economic implications of our nation's achievements in space. Brigadier General Reserve Uri Oron is a fighter pilot with experience of over 32 years in the Israel Air Force and the IDF. Mr. Oron has been managing the Israel Space Agency for the past two and a half years. Uri, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Lital, and uh, thank you, Tal, for the words, for the music, and actually for the whole inspiration. Thank you so much. Uh, the Minister of Innovation, uh, Science and Technology, Mr. Ophir Akunis, uh, the President of the Italian Space Agency, um, Professor Teodoro Valente, Chairman of the Israeli Space Agency, Professor Dan Bloomberg, the Ramon family, ambassadors, distinguished, distinguished guests. Uh, for the 19 years, this conference, named after Ilan Ramon, the first Israeli astronaut, has been held. For 19 years, uh, we have been gathering, remembering Ilan, talking, presenting, changing views. People from all over the world, people from various fields, astronauts, researchers, entrepreneurs, industry people and policymakers. For 19 years, we have been meeting. But this conference is different. We never gather like this when the state of Israel is in war. We had never gathered like this after that Saturday that shook us all. Shook the region, shook the nation, shook the whole world. And yet, we are here today. Because even when uh, we fight for what is important for us, for what is necessary 
for our existence, for what is right, we look forward. We look ahead to those places that will pull this train up the road, to those areas that will be an engine for economic, social, and international growth. We look forward to the future, not because it is the right thing to do, because it is the only way we have known for so many years. Now, this is a great opportunity for me uh, to thank each and every one of you who came here today, from near and from far. And I feel a particularly pleasant obligation to thank my friend, the president of the Italian Space Agency, I actually just uh, entered to his office, I think, about three or four months ago. Uh, uh, so thanks very much for coming. And the ambassadors who join us today, I think it's extremely important, and sometimes actions speak louder than, than words. Now, we choose to uh, emphasize uh, this conference on the, uh, uh, on the uh, various challenges uh, and opportunities that reality bring, uh, present to the, uh, to the space industry. First and foremost, the potential contribution uh, to the Israeli economy of the space sector. We believe that despite all the challenges we face, there is an ex extraordinary window for the Israeli space sector. The field of space has experienced an extraordinary momentum in the recent years. Uh, and that's, that's a known fact. I think everybody here understands that. The space industry has grown significantly in recent years, but uh, it's still largely an infant industry, not only in Israel, and it's certainly not a sustainable industry. From an analysis made by KP KPMG firm um, at the request of the uh, space agency, some interesting facts and, uh, uh, and numbers are emerged. Facts and data that I would be happy to share with you today. Now, the main question that we wanted to find out was uh, the current and the future contribution of the Israeli space industry to the Israeli economy. Along with this, we asked for a number of other uh, things and questions. And as part of the work that uh, we've done uh, with KPMG, we defined the space industry and the mapping of all these space uh, uh, Israeli companies matching the, those definitions was carrying out. Now, in order to maintain a very clear language, eventually what we decided is to adopt the OECD definition for space economy. And basically, you can, you can see it here. The most important thing is to realize those three different subsectors. The upstream sector, that is well known basically taking things up from Earth to space. The downstream sector, taking things back from space down to Earth, mainly data or images, and the, the space-derived activities, which is another very important part of what we are doing in space. It is the, not the inner circle, it's sometimes the second or the third uh, uh, circle. Now, adopting those kind of definition will enable a unified language with various entities and with international partners. What we've done also is we do the mapping of the Israeli space companies, more than 60 companies that are doing uh, directly with space, and there is much more doing the other things. Now, according to this definition, it will allow the space agency and other entities a better understanding of the market and its needs. From here to some interesting and uh, uh, enlightening data that uh, the work of KPIG presented to us data indicating the economic contribution of the space industry. Now, the, you can see that the expected economic contribution of the Israeli space industry in terms of the gross added value, right now we are sitting around uh, six uh, billion um, shekels a year. Now, when we look forward, what you can see that the, uh, the annual economic contribution of the space industry uh, right now estimated uh, in, at six billion shekel. Now, this contribution will be expected to increase two and a half times uh, by 2050. Now, the economic contribution of an employee in the space industry is 45% higher than the average wage in the market and 25% hi uh, uh, higher than in the software industry. And that's actually was number that a little bit surprised us, but those are the real, those are the real numbers. Now, the Israeli Space Agency has set its main goal 
of, uh, to build a sustainable Israeli space industry. And that's not an easy task. This is, without doubt, one of the goals of uh, the State of Israel in the field of space, and it is a goal that we can achieve together. An Israeli space industry in which dozens of companies, like you saw the numbers, operate successfully, and in which thousands of people will work, it will diversely, uh, di diversify the Israeli high-tech and will be an engine for economic and social growth. Uh, the strategic plan of the Israeli Space Agency was just, it was just approved last year by Minister Akunis, is made of uh, 18 tools and actions focused on providing the overall framework for strengthening the sustainable space ecosystem. Mainly, we emphasize action that will enable uh, initiative and, uh, uh, and entrepreneurship, thus increasing the deal flow of the space, this is the space industry. KPMG analysis shows, like I told you, that with the government intervention, we will be able to reach financial contribution level not in 2015, as you can see here in this chart, we'll be able to do that in 2035. Now that means that it will, be, it will happen 15 years earlier. What we need to do is to put the right money on the right places in order to make the deal flow of the space sector grow. It's not an easy task, but it's, it's a task that we can, we can do and we know how to do it. Now, the potential of the, uh, the uh, economic contrib uh, contribution is an important pillar, of course, but it is not the only consideration. There are other considerations uh, and reasons for uh, investing in space. A diverse space industry affects many industries and will lead to the creation of quality jobs that do not depend only on high-tech. And it will go to many, many other places all around Israel, including the, some peripheral uh, places, and we already see that. Places like Yerucham, for example, is a place that we know can build a very relevant space ecosystem inside this southern, uh, southern city. A strong space industry indicates a strong space capabilities. We know that for a fact. We look at other countries and we look at their space capabilities. So a strong space nation is a strong nation. Activity in the field of space is extensive platform for international cooperation. We see our part of the international partners sitting with us here today. And there is, of course, the contribution to research and science, basically enabling the, uh, the flourish of the whole ecosystem in Israel. Over the past few years, many technological breakthroughs have resulted from space activities in such a way that they have affected life on Earth. For example, as you see here, 3D printing, disaster management that will be discussed later on of, on a few of the panels, and many, many other more. Therefore, the development of space infrastructure contributes directly and indirectly to many, many other fields. So yes, this is a different conference. This is a different space conference from the previous 18. Our reality is different. Our day-to-day -day life are different today. But in these days, when we are fighting a just struggle like no other, we are also obligated to look to the future. And when we look at it, we see that outside the atmosphere that protects us, there is a space where there are many, many opportunities to ensure prosperity and bring growth. So yes, this year too, we will continue to talk we will to continue to present and examine together new ways in which the field of space can serve us all. We will do this as we remember the struggle and the challenges. We will do this as we remember the hostages we are so eagerly waiting to them to be back home. We will do it because this is also part of victory. I would like to thank again each and every one of you who came here today, and I wish a successful meeting and a very, very fruitful conference. Thank you so much. Uri, thank you for the enlightening talk. Please stay 
on stage for a few more minutes. Now we want to mention a special person, a person whose contribution to the field of space is receiving extraordinary recognition these days on this stage and globally. The International Astronautical Federation, the largest organization in its field with representatives from dozens of countries, organizations and companies and thousands of members has chosen to award the Distinguished Service Award to this man for his extraordinary achievements. This man is Professor Major General Reserve Itzik Ben Israel. The award is given to Professor Ben Israel for his outstanding contributions to astronautics and advancement of the Federation. Itzik served as the chairman of the Israel Space Agency between the years 2005 and 2022. Before that, Itzik contributed in a person unique and extraordinary way to the field of space as part of his various roles in the Israeli defense system, including as head of the Israel Ministry of Defense R&D agency, Mafat. The IAF's recognition of Itzik and his contribution is a source of pride for all of us and future proof that the fact that we are able to look so far is because we all stand on the shoulders of giant. And here with me on stage, Minister, Minister of Innovation, Science and Technology, Mr. Ophira Kunis, and the Chairman of the Space Agency, Professor Dan Bloomberg. Yeah. And it is a special honor to invite you, Itzik, to receive the certificate of special appreciation for your work. Professor Ben Israel, would you like to say a few words? I think it's right to say thank you and to say what you have written in it. Thank you. I'll say it in English, but uh, this is a parallel translation. Please. Okay. Uh, Certificate of Appreciation for Professor Itzik Ben Israel uh, in Boca. In <laughs> appreciation. Appreciation. For the long years that you spent at the agency and your contribution, your yeah. immense, huge contribution to promotion of space science in Israel, uh, science, industry, and as the chairman of the Space Agency from 2005 to 2022. So thank you, Itzik. Do you want to say a few words, uh, Itzik? Minister of Science, uh, Innovation, Science and Technology, Mr. Okunis, the Chairman of Israeli Space Agency, Professor Bloomberg, and the Director General of the Space Agency, Uri Aron. Uh, it's always uh, exciting to get the appreciation uh, letters and the award uh, uh, that I are just uh, going to receive to be more accurate uh, next month from the International Astronautics um, uh, Federation. But uh, I must say that the way I view it is it's not really a personal, personal um, um, uh, award. It is a kind of appreciation to Israeli space activity generally, generally 
and, uh, and especially the um, uh, work of Israeli Space Agency. And therefore, I would like to share all this uh, appreciation and honor with, uh, with the whole community represented here, and, and especially with the uh, director generals of the Israeli Space Agency who uh, were working hard with me on these issues, um, starting with, uh, um, uh, during my term, with uh, uh, Abby Areven, Areven, then uh, Tzvika Kaplan, uh, Menachem Kidron, um, uh, Avi Blasberger, and of course, um, uh, Uri Oron. It's, all of you should say, should look at it as if you have a part in this uh, uh, appreciation and award. I, I, I don't want to give you a speech. I would only, uh, I mean, I, I feel I cannot live without mentioning my old friend, Ilan Ramon. Um, I was, I had the, I'm, sometimes I'm proud I had, uh, I played a, ro um, a role in selecting him for the mission which ended with a uh, tragedy. Uh, and I still, until today, I admire the way the family, especially the wife, Rona, chose to commemorate his name, not by you know buildings and things like this, but by investing in education, uh, especially education of younger generations. Thank you all for the award, and I hope uh, this is not the end of the story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ben Israel. Now we want to take a, a break for 20 minutes and we're going to meet back here for more inspiring talks and panels.
למרות שראית וגילית כל השאלות שבדרך שאלת לפעמים לא העזת לגלות אורות מהרבבים בשתי שניות חולפים חיי אל מול עיניי קולות מזמן אחר הלב אומר להתעורר מהר כל הדרכים נפתחות לפניך להתגלות מול עיניך, מחייך, כל התהיות נעלמות ברגע, ועכשיו ברור מה חשוב ומה פחות
הגזלים שלי עזבו את הקר, פרסו כנפיים ועפו. ואני ציפור זגנה נשארתי בקר, מקווה מאוד שהכל יהיה בסדר. עכשיו נשארנו לבדנו בכיף, אבל אנחנו ביחד. חבקי אותי חזק, תגידי לי כן. אל תדאגי ביחד, כיף להזדקן. אוף גוזר חתוך את השמיים, טוס לאן שבא לך, רק אל תשכח, יש נשר בשמיים, גור לך. אני יודע שככה זה בטבע, וגם אני עזבתי כן. אבל עכשיו, כשבא הרגע, אז מחדיר קצת בגרון, מחדיר קצת Thank you. Thank you. 
של קדושה, ולמונו התשעה. עצובה ושותקת, מעט שיר לסיפור על קרוב, על רחוק אני רץ, 
אני חייב להקפיא כל מה שהעולם מציע, כל מה שהאוויר מגיע וזה לא מפריע, הוא מלטף אותי. ויש אצלך אור, למה לי לעצור? אני רץ, אני חייב להפעיל כל עוד שאני מניע, כל מה שאני מזיע וזה לא מפריע, הוא ממסטן לו אותי. ויש אצלך אור, אני בטח עוד אחזור. גבירותיי ורבותיי, שלום, אנחנו מבקשים לתפוס מקומות, מיד נתחיל שוב את החלק הבא שלנו. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats, we are about to begin our next uh, chapter in this uh, interesting day, so please take your seats, we're going to start in uh, just a while. It is great seeing you all back here after hearing about the economic impact of Israel's space industry. We'll now talk about the role of space agencies globally. I'm delighted to invite to the stage Dr. Dganit Paikovsky to moderate our first panel. Dr. Paikovsky from the Hebrew University is an expert on international relations with a unique focused and first-hand experience in the interface between space and world politics. Ganit, please join me on the stage and introduce the panelists. Good morning. I've been doing this for several years, but believe me, I'm still excited. Um, I'm honored to open this special session on space agencies and beyond. 
multiple clients in the space market. This morning's panel includes distinguished speakers representing diverse international perspectives overlooking global space activities as providers and in accordance with this panel's theme as customers. In previous Ilan Ramon conferences, we focused on the different roles and responsibilities that agencies have in advancing space activities. Today, we would like to focus um, more narrowly on the role of space agencies as first clients or customers in an effort to make, to make sure they are not the only ones, eventually. So in this context, we are here today to discuss the interrelationship between agencies and the private sector to provide entry to market and some, provide some validation for future investors and customers. Please welcome to the stage Professor Teodoro Valente, President of the Italian Space Agency, I invite you to sit you. Uh, in front of your photo behind you. Mr. Jean-Marc Astrog, the Chief Strategy Officer at CNES. <laughs> Dr. Christian Feistinger, Executive Director of the International Astronautical Federation, the IAF. And Professor Dan Bloomberg, the chairperson of the Israel Space Agency. While they're sitting, I would say that if I read their bios, we will never finish in time and we won't have any time for questions. Therefore, I invite you to check their bios on the website uh, of the conference. And before I point out the first question, I would like to tell you that I deeply appreciate that you've come here today from afar and that you chose to come here in person to express support and acknowledgement of the Israel space ecosystem during the challenging and difficult times that Israel is currently facing. In this respect, your deeds... <laughs> thank you. In this respect, your deeds are more important than your words. Thank you. Let me begin. I would like to start by asking Dr. Feistinger and, Dr. and Professor Bloomberg, um, how do you think being an early customer of space companies help push the boundaries of technology and accelerate innovation in the space sector? So generally, I want to start off by saying that Space is a very challenging environment. And when you're an early customer, you're... I hope now everyone can hear me. Thank you. Uh, so I'll say that again. Space is an extremely challenging environment. Early customers and early uh, uh, inventors are always... They have to make breakthroughs. And I think that space and the immense challenges that it creates actually makes everything that we do in space a huge breakthrough, not only to space, but to other issues. So we're actually creating new technologies, new science, uh, understanding the universe by being early customers and by being early inventors. And I think we're going to touch upon that in a moment again when we talk about uh, academia and other mm -hmm. things, but yes. I'll, I'll leave that part for leave, uh, the next Chris, question. Christian, please. Yeah, thank you, Deganit, and um, let me just express um, on behalf of the International Astronautical Federation, we are really pleased to be here. Uh, there is a very long-standing history of close cooperation between our federation and Israel, Israel Space Agency. We've organized together with you two very successful congresses, International Astronautical Congresses, the last one in 2015 in Jerusalem, 
And this is really what the International Astronautical Federation can contribute to the development of space globally, that is providing a neutral platform where all the different stakeholders, and uh, if we talk about stakeholders, it's of course first and foremost the space agencies, but also space industry, academia, space universities, can come together and share uh, knowledge exchange and set up new partnerships. Um, the National Astronautical Federation was created some 74 years ago, so we have uh, a very long-standing history created uh, in times of the Cold War, actually, and originally, the principle in our federation was one country, one member. So we had some nine or ten members that were the founding members, and these were typically space societies of the different countries. But now, uh, but then gradually over the years, the Federation felt that we need to open up. And of course, um, then more and more members came in and we opened up to other categories and most, uh, uh, most importantly, space agencies. Today you have about, uh, well, more than 40 space agencies and space offices worldwide and we are very proud to be able to say that practically all of them are a member in our federation. And these are the big ones, the NASA, the ESA, but also the smaller ones, smaller countries. Um, and today the federation has 513 members from 77 countries, so we are a really a truly a global organization. And of course, one category that is the, the biggest today and has also the biggest potential of further growth is companies, is industry. Today, the number of startups and small companies that are coming up is almost unlimited. So every year when we welcome some 50 new members, the biggest portion is industry. And um, coming back to your question, what the Federation, what we can contribute to this kind of uh, agencies supporting startups and uh, industry as first customer is to prov provide this platform where agencies can meet and hear from these startups to give startups also a platform to present what they have to offer and space agencies to kind of hear from where they can really invest also and where they need to support. Thank you. Professor Valente and Mr. Astrog, we've heard about the potential, but it's risky, it's challenging. So what are the major challenges that you see from your agency perspective in taking the role of early customers or first customers? Uh, first of all, good morning to everybody. Thank you for this invitation, which I have accepted with a real pleasure in order to represent uh, I would say the Italian space or space in Italy. And uh, in this, uh, I would say, uh, terrible and unbelievable period, we heard uh, a few minutes ago by my friend Uri Ron that we, look, we must look forward, we must look to the future. And uh, space is one of the pillars for this. We will do it with the cooperation and the discussion uh, between all peaceful people. So having said that, coming to your question, I think in my opinion, in my opinion that being uh, the first customer, it presents some major challenges with respect to the usual way of doing. And this includes, for example, significant risk with unproven mm -hmm. products, the need of uh, reliable due diligence on the company and technology, uh, poten potential cost overruns due uh, to development issues, uh, the necessity of uh, market development efforts also, very important, and the requirement of a long-term commitment that could be difficult if uh, the technology outperforms with respect to the, let's say, what expected. And especially for the unproven technology, a very important topic is the risk management of that, uh, because we need a, a, a rigorous process of phase testing 
validation, most of time, incremental implementation of these new technologies, and very clear milestones uh, together also with very clear contractual agreements uh, on performance and uh, cost containment. And uh, we sometimes also need to rely on, uh, let's say, fallback options uh, and also to expert reviews in order to uh, mitigate the risk. So it's a quite different jobs also for the, an agency with respect to the usual way of working with uh, in, in other contexts. Thank you. Mr. Westrog. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, first, uh, let me say that I'm deeply honored to be there today. Uh, Philippe Baptiste, our chairman, was not able to come, but uh, we uh, believe it was very important that CNES and France was, uh, was present today in these dramatic uh, circumstances. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'd like to say that we have a very fruitful cooperation with Israeli Space uh, Agency, uh, and we look forward to continue it on a scientific uh, project. Uh, I'd like to put things maybe in perspectives. Because, you know, I entered CNES, I uh, started my career in 1985, a long time ago. At that time, uh, we had only a few projects in France, in Space Agency, uh, one launcher, Ariane, a few satellites, Earth observation satellites, telecommunication satellites. We have a few industry. Uh, the, f the funding was 100% public, uh, and uh, the organization was pyramidal government, agency, industry. And government was speaking to uh, agency, agency was giving orders to industry. No need to say that today the situation is completely different. And it is a good thing. Uh, com uh, space has become a commercial business. It's still strategic, and I would say that it is more and more strategic, but on top of that, it is commercial. So we have private funding, we have a lot of startup. It has been said before, everybody is talking with everybody. Sometimes it's easier for a six months born startup to speak to the French uh, President of the Republic uh, than, than to the President of CNES. But it is like that. Uh, so it's completely different. And we had to adapt. First, we were requested by our government to adapt and to support this new born ecosystem. How we do that? We do that by changing our procurement policy. To make things simple, specify less, uh, being in a support uh, to projects of orders, which is very difficult for a 60 years old agency, which has been quite successful in some, uh, some project, to say, okay, this is your project, maybe it's not a good idea, but we support it, we help you, one, no matter what we believe about that. So it's a big change. And also, we, uh, we apply a new procurement uh, policy by buying services instead of products. In instead of developing satellites, uh, we procure the data of the satellite, and we do it before they even exist. And uh, this, I, I would say the same as uh, Professor Valente, it's a big risk for agencies. You know, public procurement, we'd like to, to buy things that are demonstrated, uh, well, uh, well demonstrated, and here we are, we are asked to take a risk. So we do it, we have specific, uh, let's say, process to do that. We continue to develop scientific projects, we take less risk for scientific uh, cooperation and projects, but on top of that, uh, to support this newborn ecosystem, we have specific uh, tools. Thank you. Uh, Professor Valente, can, and in, in continuation to what you just said, can you share specific success or success stories or lessons learned from previous collaborations between the ASI and, and private uh, companies? Or maybe you can highlight elements that contributed to the success or provided valuable um, insights for the future? Yeah. Uh, I mean, most of times, at least up to my knowledge, uh, uh, space agency often they do have infrastructure and expertise which are not, uh, which are invaluable in terms of estimation to private companies uh, and which can be very synergic with the uh, expertise which are inside the private companies. 
Uh, in this sense, uh, I just want to give to you a couple of examples for what it concerns the Italian Space Agency. Uh, we have uh, some, I will underline just two, uh, successful histories of cooperation and stories uh, uh, with uh, our industries. The first one is a company uh, which is called Igios. That's a joint venture between uh, Telespazio, mm -hmm. which is a Leonardo and Tails company, and the Italian Space Agency. And uh, it, it's a real example of successful public-private uh, partnership cooperation in the Earth observation sector. IGEOS uh, is operating on the Cosmos SkyMed data uh, which is the first example in Italy of an uh, institutional collaboration between the agency and the defense. And so it is uh, something which has a dual nature, but is working, it is working on the uh, civil sector. Okay. And um, the program might be beneficial for many, many uh, applications, monitoring, for example, environmental disaster, and together also with data exchange with other agencies, I just want to remember, for example, the exchange of data by COSMO and ALOS2 with the JAXA uh, for, unfortunately, disasters in our country and, and also in Japan, but also for monitoring agriculture, uh, defense and security, obviously, in this case, application. Another example, uh, in this case, uh, is a company which is called Altec, mm -hmm. Uh, which is in Turin, not of Italy. Uh, it means aerospace logistic technology engineering company. And again, that's a public-private company, which is owned by ASI, ASI and Thales Alenia Space. And uh, it provides engineering and logistic services and supports also the operation, actually, uh, on the International Space Station, where. Italy built one of the three existing modules uh, on the ISS. And uh, Altec, for example, was a company to which we funded just before Christmas holidays a new uh, project in order to build um, a lunar robotic control mission system in Turin, which is going to be added to the Martian facilities. And so, uh, both these examples, uh, up to me, they underscore the significance of collaboration between public and private institutions, and uh, that is the Italian space agencies and private companies, uh, to push on uh, advancement in space technology. And this collaboration is very important because uh, uh, it helps all of us, not only in reducing the cost management, uh, uh, but also to define together from different point of views, institutional and business basis, uh, future programs, in this case, for example, exploration or earth observation, uh, to be beneficial for everybody. Thank you. And if I, when I listen to both of you, Mr. Astrog and Professor Valenta, you talk about the challenge in adapting of making these fluctuations towards each other. So I want to come back to you, Mr. Ostrog, and ask you about the, how does CNES adapt, in particular in terms of contractual relationships with the industry? What are the lessons that you've learned from the last, last few years? That it is difficult to adapt, <laughs> especially when you are a, a whole organization. That has been, uh, again, I said, uh, quite successful uh, for some, uh, some projects. Uh, but we implemented a specific organization. We selected people who are willing to support startup instead of imposing, uh, you know, to, uh, to engineers uh, to, uh, to do so. It's not a matter of edge. It's a matter of uh, openness, of culture, and so on. So we put them in a specific organization uh, Four year, five years ago, mm -hmm. it's called Connect by CNES. Okay. Uh, their role is uh, to support newcomers in the space business. And there are, as we said, many uh, newcomers in automotive industry, aeronautics, uh, energy, and so on, and so on. And um, we provide them with a specific budget. 
uh, a small one. Uh, it's not necessary to, to spend, uh, you know, tens of uh, million euros to, 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 to help, especially uh, for seed, uh, for starting the, the business. Then, when the startup grow, uh, it's out of reach for, uh, for space agencies. Um, and they provide um, um, a series of tools to support the startup, technical expertise. Uh, that's necessary because we are working in a difficult and challenging technological uh, field. Uh, access to, uh, to funding. Uh, space is complex. Space organization is complex. You have many, many gates in, in France, in Europe, uh, between ESA, between European Union, uh, to, uh, to have access to contracts and so on. So these newcomers do not know that. So it's important to help them to know which gate to use and so on. Uh, we provide also access to accelerators, startup accelerators. Uh, we created a specific accelerators called Space Funders, uh, together uh, with uh, Italy and to, to, with, with Germany and Italy has joined uh, that. Uh, we are working with the BLAST uh, accelerator in France, which is also located in Israel, uh, by, by the way. An accelerator is very important for the startup to, uh, to grow. Uh, we provide education, uh, space education. We have a specific and free educational program uh, for, uh, for space. Uh, it's, uh, it's on the web. It's for people knowing nothing on space activities, space applications. We had 3,000 people following that program, including ministers in France who are interested in learning about space capabilities and so on. So it's a big, it's a big success. So we really had a, a professional team of people in charge of doing that in CNES. What is difficult is to transform this uh, small team spirit uh, to the large uh, CNES organization. But we are working on that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bloomberg, this session is focused on agencies and what they do with the private sector, but we know that eventually this ecosystem cannot survive without academia. So what is the role of academia, of the academic research in this interrelationship, um, especially regarding services that we want to advance further into future daily life? So thank you for that question. Um, when you talk about academic or academia's inventions, technologies that come out of academia, anyone here sitting in this audience that comes from industry is gonna say that uh, anything done in academia is at most TRL2, mostly TRL1. Uh, we don't, yeah, I can see the smiles already on the faces over here. We all know the, uh, the laugh that you get when you say that you have a great invention coming out of university, and they'll all say, it's far from being anything we can use for a space mission. Now that's the downside, but the really the upside of that is that everything we do in academia is breakthroughs. Now of those breakthroughs, yes, it's true, 80 to 90% will never mature to a technology that can be launched. But for the 10 or 20% that can mature, that's where we're making the big, big breakthroughs. Now that's extremely important. Anything that uh, has to do with new technologies, and I can give a few examples, but any science missions are based on academic research. They need open-mindedness. They need uh, processes that are not always defined that you know the methodology, but you're not focused on a specific result, that you can accept different results than you have. So any new ideas that come around physics come from academia, analysis of things related to space. Um, in our lab, we worked on hyperspectral images using compressive sensing. None of those have been launched into space yet. We get the same smile when we mention it. But the challenge is actually taking it from TRL2 to TRL7, 8, and eventually 9. That's a big challenge. But those ideas do come out of academia. Some of the, you know, the useful things that we use in everyday life have gone through the process of starting in academia, going into space, coming back 
to serve us in our daily lives. Um, internet, much of it started in academia. Now that's not a space technology, but it serves us in space. And a lot of what we do in space could not be used, done without that. But memory foam, some of us sleep on tempura mattresses at night. That was developed for the space shuttle. Velcro was developed for, the space, for astronauts. You know, we use that on a lot of things nowadays, Velcro. Some of the diapers were developed for the astronauts. And everything that goes into that diaper that absorbs liquids was developed there. It's used now also in agriculture. Um, the same materials. In Israel, we have a lot of things that are coming out of academia that go into our space industry also. So I mentioned hyperspectral. Uh, I saw over here earlier representatives from uh, Astera that use synthetic aperture radar. It started off in academia looking at uh, water leaks from space. Um, uh, Ramondo here in the room also started off in an academic institution that came from academia and now is a startup company. So I think academia actually plays a huge role, much bigger than we ever thought. And it's something that you cannot ignore when you talk about a space industry, because you need those new ideas. You need those out of the box ideas. You need them coming not only from us, the professors. You need them coming from students that haven't been uh, molded into boxes yet, that can think out of the box, really out of the box, that have not been in the industry yet. So academia plays a huge role. Academia also plays a role in the analysis of the results. And there, I think, you know, there's no other way because the amount of data that we collect in space is huge. And it's the master's students, the PhD students that at the end of the day look at all of that data. Thank you. And back to you, Christian. You hear the discussion about the interrelations, and you have a different perspective, maybe from space, overlooking the whole ecosystem. Um, and you nicely describe the growth and the evolution of the Federation over the past several decades. So from your perspectives, in what way um, space agencies continue to contribute to further development of the Federation, of the, of the Federation as a multi-stakeholder space environment? Yeah, thank you for the question, Deganit. And I want to mention that you have been one of our IEF vice presidents for many years uh, in the past. So you know very well, um, of course, how we are structured. You have also created um, very important but, but initiatives. They, 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 yeah. they, they don't, don't therefore know. I mentioned they need to know. Yes. Uh, the um, IEF International Space um, Economic uh, economics platform, um, but coming back to your question, yes, I mean we have a bit the privilege to to be out of the different sectors and 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 uh, look at it, and what we 've seen over the last years, I think is a really stunning transformation why where in the past, uh, as Jean-Marc has mentioned, everything was kind of very straightforward. Government giving the guideline, the agencies are picking the industry, providing contracts. Today it is much more complex. And of course, why is this uh, system um, establishing itself? Uh, because it is, in some aspect, more efficient. And what means more efficient? More efficient means that it can be the implementation of a project with, um, under the leadership of industry, and as agency, as a customer, can be cheaper, can be uh, quicker to be implemented. That's what the main advantages are. But as was mentioned before, of course, somebody will need to, to pay a price for that. And that is certainly the agency that is taking part of the risk or a big part of the risk. At the end, we are talking about taxpayers' money, which the agency, uh, the agencies, of course, need to justify how they are spending and why they are spending it in a way that may be cheaper and quicker but maybe more risky in terms of success. 
Um, I think this is a very important aspect, of course, to, uh, to have in mind, because uh, the, the general public today needs to kind of understand how space today works. I think in the past, uh, the enthusiasm about space was there over years, then in the, in the recent years, I think there was a bit of a kind of downsize of it. Nobody was really getting excited anymore about space. But today, I think, again, we are living in a very, very exciting time. Um, and here, the Federation, like our Federation, have a very important role in order to popularize space again, in order to kind of advertise for space and uh, explain also and show and demonstrate to the public what space can really bring to daily life of people. And then, of course, they are asking the money. Uh, the question is the money, our taxpayers' money used in the right way. And I think um, what the recent months and years have shown is that this new system that is just about to develop and it will still develop further has its uh, uh, big advantages and I really, uh, I think we need to appreciate also what agencies are doing in terms of taking the risk, the risk. and giving startups and small companies a chance to show that they can do maybe quicker, that they can do maybe cheaper, but of course not always. 100% success guaranteed. Thank you. Uh, we are getting to the last round of questions in, in this uh, session. Um, and I want to offer Professor Bloomberg um, the opportunity to speak and, and ask you, how do you evaluate this cost effectiveness of partnering with space companies compared to traditional government-led developments? So I want to start off by saying uh, something. We spoke here about startups, we spoke about agencies, we spoke about a federation, uh, and we spoke about academia. And we spoke about challenges of taking you know, new ideas, materializing them at the end to some space mission. And I think, and this comes out of a discussion that I had with Dr. Cohen earlier, the big challenge is going from uh, science fiction to science mission. If I had to put a uh, title at yes. the end of this session, I think that would be the sound bit for this session. Science fiction to science mission. And that's a challenge for all of us. Now, cost effectiveness is something that's very difficult to measure economically. If you ask you know, what the uh, monetary value of a science mission is, no one, will give, no one will want to give you an answer on that. Even though you do know that any of our missions eventually did pay off. So I'll give you one example. It's related to NASA. When I was a student, uh, the amount of data that the NASA administrator permitted to downlink back to Earth from a Mars mission was limited. The end result was data compression. Data compression serves us in everyday lives now. But when that was launched, the idea was how do we reduce the cost, reduce the cost of the amount of students analyzing the data uh, to try and look at cost effectiveness. That's the wrong term to use when you talk about breakthroughs. We actually need to spend that money and hope that we know what we're doing at the end, is that in the long term, it serves humanity. That's a nice way of looking at the cost effectiveness, and I'm with you. Um, Mr. Strog, we've talked about the challenges, and Christian um, was talking about the um, immense risk that agencies uh, need to bear. Um, what are the new tools that you're implementing at CNES uh, to develop the ecosystem and to manage these kind of risks? Um, I'd like to take one, one example, um, which is um, based on a fund uh, which has been implemented by President Macron a few years ago, which is called France 2030, which is not only related to space, uh, but also to nuclear energy, to artificial intelligence, to deep sea uh, research. Uh, but there is 1.5 billion euro 
dedicated to, to space. Um, by the way, it has been reduced to 1.3 billion euros. We, we lost 200 million, uh, by the way. And, and, um, and the way to spend that money was completely different to what we did before with big programs. It was oriented to new commerce uh, for new markets. And the idea was to promote the utilization of space data among uh, public and private users. And we have been asked in CNES to, to, to release a big call in all French administrations, and there are a lot of French administrations, uh, national, local, and so on, to say to them, uh, you will get free space data during three years. You just have to express your need. And then CNES will collect all the needs. We will organize call for tenders. Uh, we will select uh, companies, startup, but not only startup. Uh, they will deliver data to you. For instance, the customs uh, express a need to, uh, you know, observe the ships uh, and so on. So we selected uh, one uh, one startup called On Seed Labs, which which uh, have developed a very smart way to detect uh, ships, even when they cut their uh, anti-collision system from space. Uh, with, uh, with satellite and so on. And so we, we procure uh, this data to that startup. Uh, they provide uh, a lot of data that are now distributed to customs, to uh, maritime authorities, to harbor, and so on. So it's a very uh, original way to stimulate the utilization of space data. And the idea is that after three years, of course, these administrations, they will have to pay or to say, okay, I do not need uh, this, uh, this data. So just to mention a very specific way to, to stimulate the ecosystem uh, for startup uh, and for, uh, for new markets. Excellent, thank you. Professor Valente, if I combine uh, what, we've, what we've just been talking uh, about, and you look into the future, you just started your position, congratulations. Uh, Professor Bloomberg said, we need to go from science fiction to space mission. So how do you envision the next decade and um, the stra strategies that agencies need to, need to adopt now to make this uh, vision really happen? Thank you for your question. Uh, I mean, if we look to the international debate uh, or discussion uh, or action already put on, into the table, into place, uh, for example, in the USA, but not only in the USA, let's think just an example in India, for example. Uh, I, in my opinion, actually, what is going to, what is happening is, is that space agencies uh, are evolving in their role to become a catalyst for private sector growth. And uh, by acting, uh, as we said before, as force client and uh, by using a sort of space term, uh, space agencies can, can be a sort of launch pad uh, for private companies uh, to enter the space market with confidence, uh, but also to validate the capabilities for future investors. Uh, it seems to me, uh, in order to be synthetic, that a space agency should have, must have, a sort of double role from one side, facilitator, from the other one, uh, enable. And uh, this is the philosophy of uh, our Italian space agency, because uh, we are, and so this is the way in which we see the future, uh, we are uh, involved as force client, uh, but not just about or only procurement. Uh, we want to support and we are supporting innovation, actions in order to reduce barriers uh, and to contribute ultimately to the vitality of the space uh, area. Let me just give a couple examples to you. Uh, in our board, of, uh, in my board, in our board of directors, we do have colleagues uh, which bring to us the point of view of the Ministry of University of Research. We do have colleagues uh, which bring to us the point of view of uh, the Ministry of uh, Enterprises. 
so start up, private, etc. And of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we do have to couple uh, space diplomacy, which is very important, as putting the agency as an enable hmm, for international collaboration. Then let me come back to the point of uh, Professor Bloomberg. I, I am coming from academia, so research and development is the future. We will not have any more future technology without any research and development activities. And in this area, for example, we do have, as Italian Space Agency, uh, a very huge number of agreement uh, with the Italian University and with public research centers in Italy. We just signed uh, before uh, Christmas uh, a framework agreement uh, with the, we call it CRUI, this is the uh, association of all directors of the Italian University in order to put uh, efforts together with a synergy, in a synergic way. And then last but not least, and this is also involves our Ministry of University of Research, we do have all the actions which are strictly necessary and required on education and outreach because we need qualified human capitals, we need to push our teenagers, our, uh, how to say, students, our sons, to develop passion if it's fine for them, for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which, are, which is essential for future activities in the space. And uh, coming back to the industrial side, uh, I think that, so to the concept of the first client, we just mentioned again before, I think that being the first client for an agency in the future um, will allow to private companies to demonstrate their capability and technology in a real world context, not locally, but internationally. And uh, this is not only facilitates the market approach, uh, the market revenue, the market share, uh, but it is essential also for the validation uh, for potential investors. And now uh, we are moving through more competitions, and so this is very important, which can just remember the debate at the last Sevilla conference, it's very important that the inversors can rely on a reliable assessment. And uh, in this contest, uh, and I finished, uh, I think that also the international collaboration is crucial for the success of the global space ecosystem. And so this is the reason because of we, but not, not only we, I mean, everybody uh, which share this, this vision will come partnership with uh, private companies from around the world, uh, knowing that a different expertise, uh, new fresh resources uh, strengthens the entire industry for the future competition. Thank you. And with what you ended with, I'm going to move to the last question to Christian and talk about collaboration. You look at things from a very global perspective, space is challenging, but also the commercial and the political environments are challenging. How does the IAF manage space relationships in challenging commercial and political environments? Yeah, thank you, Deganit, for this question. I wanted to kind of continue from what Professor Valenti was just mentioning, space diplomacy. <clears throat> which kind of where, where space cooperation is a very important aspect, of course. Um, I think this, especially in times of geopolitical instability worldwide, um, uh, uh, space can again show that it, is, uh, it has the potential to contribute to diplomacy uh, on, on, on a global scale. Um, and that's wh what one of the major missions also of our federation is, because by bringing together these different actors, coming from 77 different countries worldwide, um, agencies that are typically known for open, being open for cooperation, industries that are typically also known for harsh competition, 
um, academia, which again is kind of the basis of, of uh, everything which industry and also agency is basing their activities on, uh, and bringing all this together on neutral grounds. And that is where it brings us back to the original foundation of our federation, where uh, in the time of the Cold War, some wise people said, well, we should have uh, a platform where the East and the West can meet and exchange, which was not possible in any bilateral format, but in a multilateral format, it is possible. And, and since then, we've been true really to our um, motto, connecting all space people for a sustainable future. We will continue to do that through our events, uh, uh, through providing this neutral platform in kind of a spirit of cooperation. And we are very happy that we are successful so far. And I think there is still a lot to do today and also in the coming years. Thank you very much. And with that, we conclude. Let's pray together that we manage together to move from science fiction, peaceful fiction, to good reality and to space missions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Paikovsky and our esteemed panelists. As we delve into the ever-evolving landscape of space exploration, it is crucial for us to gain insight into the activities that have defined the past year in the space sector. Mr. Tal Inbal will provide us with a comprehensive review of 2023 in space. Mr. Inbal is a space and missiles analyst and consultant working with the Israeli and foreign governments. Tal, the stage is yours. Uh, well, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Almost uh, lunchtime. And uh, for me, it's a special uh, conference because it's like uh, coming home to the Israel uh, Air Force Center after several years. And I remember when we started this uh, space conference then uh, at, at, the, at the time, 2006, I could recall by heart the number of satellites that went up each year, because it was roughly 1,000 satellites in total, and every year less, uh, less than uh, 100 satellites uh, came up. And this is not the case anymore. And each uh, year, I can tell you it's a wow year in space. I'm not going to give you anything about uh, the space economics, but just a glimpse into what uh, humanities succeeded by sending some very interesting space missions. And uh, like uh, my good friend uh, Danny Bloomberg said, it is uh, almost science fiction uh, missions. Uh, but let's uh, start with a few numbers. Uh, last year, we saw a huge amount of launches. And many people at the audience here might remember then uh, at the time, uh, one launch vehicle equals one satellite. And of course, this is not the case today. So we saw 211 successes, 11 failures worldwide, one partial failure. Usually, it means that the satellite is in space, but not in the correct orbit. Uh, and almost 3,000 satellites made it into space last year alone. So this is, a, again, a world record, and I believe that uh, in the 20th Elon Ramon conference, uh, this record will break once more. So uh, who sent uh, satellite into space? This is not uh, the number of satellites, but uh, the countries that launched uh, some missions, uh, satellites, uh, space uh, explorations, and so on. And you can see 116 from the United States, most of them, uh, are by a private company, SpaceX. So SpaceX is uh, an amazing company, of course, and you can see the share of launches from that company. 
Um, you can compare it with the world, not just uh, in, inside the United States. And 67 from China, 19 from Russia. You can see Israel, one launch, a very successful launch, and the satellite, this was not the, the only satellite that went into space that was made in Israel, but the other one was launched uh, by SpaceX to a uh, customer abroad. And we saw launches from Iran. And by the way, Iran is trying hard to make it into this conference uh, for years. And just recently, they launched uh, three satellites by a relatively not so reliable launch vehicle. It was the first ever orbital insertion of satellites from this uh, launch vehicle. And to hear more about it, you have to come, you'll have to come to next year's conference. Most of the satellites are going into low Earth orbit, meaning that this is a very crowded environment in space. A lot of challenges uh, for space uh, situational awareness and uh, how to operate in such a dense uh, environment in space is an ever-growing challenge for every space mission and every space-faring nation. And uh, we can see... Uh, a large decline in the number of satellites going to higher orbit, like uh, the geostationary orbit. This is because uh, at least some of the traditional uh, uses of such a high orbit uh, is now being replaced by low uh, Earth orbit constellations, uh, like uh, that of the uh, SpaceX and the uh, Amazon, Project Kuiper, and of course the uh, Starlink and Star Shield. And we saw several new nations, new countries with uh, their own national satellite, and uh, I don't know what was the reason b behind the Pope's decision to send a satellite into space. Nevertheless, it was a very successful mission with uh, cooperation uh, with the uh, University of Rome. And other space uh, countries now, you can call them space country, you can see Albania, Djibouti, Ireland, Oman, and like I said, the Vatican City. So uh, among the more than 200 countries in the world, uh, more than 70 countries uh, possess their own satellites. So this is a very good uh, ratio, but uh, there are many more countries to, uh, uh, that need to go into space. So I believe next year, this slide won't be empty. We will see new flags uh, inside. So um, we said uh, uh, goodbye. And uh, uh, merci pour uh, votre service uh, for the Ariane uh, 5 space launcher. And we all remember two years ago, it uh, successfully placed in space the James Webb Space Telescope. And we saw first flight of many new satellite launch vehicles. In red, this uh, symbolizes um, a failure, and in gray a success, and if it's uh, gray and red, it's not my mistake, it's uh, some, you can call it successful failure, you can call it, you could call it a partial success. So we saw several new launchers from China, and we saw, uh, of course, the long-awaited launch, the first launch of uh, Starship by SpaceX, and actually we saw also the second one, and it could be, in the February this year that we will see the third launch of this mega rocket. 21 astronauts launched uh, into orbit in 2022. This is an average uh, rate of uh, uh, crewed missions to space, uh, three from the United States, all of them on board the Dragon space fly, uh, spacecraft. Uh, one of them is a pri was a private mission, the AX-2, and one, now AX-3 is in space. Two Shenzhou uh, missions from China and one Soyuz launch from Russia. But uh, don't uh, forget the suborbital regime of space. And we saw uh, 36 people that uh, went over the Karman line, all of them uh, inside the space plane uh, by uh, Virgin Galactic. So uh, we saw also in this uh, regard, we saw a governmental mission from Italy. Uh, Several people from the Italian Air Force uh, went into a suborbital uh, flight, and so you can see <laughs> the uh, Italian flag inside. So we can now understand that this is not about ju or just about uh, space tourism. It's about research. It, uh, it's about experience of people uh, launching themselves into a weightlessness environment, even if it's uh, uh, just for a few minutes. 
And of course, uh, we saw the uh, uh, announcement of the crew, the lucky crew of uh, Artemis 2. I still don't uh, sure when they will go uh, to their space mission, but it will be the first uh, crewed mission uh, around the world, uh, around the moon, uh, with no landing since December 1972. And this is uh, something like a science fiction mission. And you can see from the timeline that we have to be very patient uh, in order to get the scientific results from uh, deep space missions. Uh, so uh, Europe, uh, European Space Agency launched successfully the JUICE mission to Jupiter and its icy moons. And there is something from Israel uh, on board as well. Uh, an atomic clock by uh, Israeli firm Acubit. So the launch in 2023, uh, they will, the, the um, spacecraft will arrive just in uh, uh, 2031. So we will have to wait to hold a panel on the results of those uh, scientific explorations of um, Jupiter and its uh, icy moons, including Europa, with, the, with its under, uh, underground, under ice uh, ocean. So maybe life will be found on this uh, very interesting uh, place. And we saw the world's first launch of a 3D printed launcher. More than 75% uh, of all the mass, exclude, excluding the uh, fuel, the propellants, are 3D printed. And it was uh, almost total success, meaning that uh, it lofted and pass uh, through Max-Q and uh, successful separation between first and second stage, successful ignition of the second stage, but then it cut off. Nevertheless, the company, which is a private company, uh, Relativity Space, already announced that they will not build another one like this, and they are moving forward to the operational launcher, also 3D printed. And I spoke about uh, the Starship, and, and this is indeed a new era, uh, already Elon Musk uh, reduced the price of uh, one kilogram into orbit by an order of magnitude already uh, by using its uh, Falcon 9. And of course, the key word is uh, not just the reliability, but reusability of the launcher, at least the first uh, stage. And this will uh, uh, make the next uh, revolution in space and access to space almost for all, because the cost per, for uh, one kilogram into space will be lower again by an order of magnitude uh, in comparison to what we are now today. And we saw the perseverance of uh, DPRK in North Korea after two success, uh, successive failures. They managed to uh, understand what went wrong, and they placed a satellite using a new type of uh, satellite launch vehicle. And this is not a ballistic missile, but it uh, got a lot of the technologies, and, uh, especially the engines, uh, from th that country's uh, ballistic missile uh, program. And we saw the first flight of two astronauts from Saudi Arabia, and some, some of you on the audience met at least uh, the astronaut on the right, uh, in Baku when we uh, were at the IAF. Uh, so Saudi Arabia uh, is uh, very active in space and they have a, a very uh, enthusiastic people at the Saudi Space uh, Commission and Saudi Space uh, Agency. And we saw also a demonstration of Iran's space capsule, it's like Iranian Mercury. It will carry an Iranian astronaut to a suborbital mission in the next few years. So we know about it uh, at least from 2012, uh, but uh, this was the first launch, suborbital, uncrewed, and it was unsuccessful uh, during the landing phase. Nevertheless, it will be interesting. And NASA, of course, uh, NASA uh, conducted some magic uh, and they uh, retrieve the space capsule from uh, OSIRIS-REx mission to an asteroid. And as you can see on the, on the bottom left, they even succeeded uh, in opening the box and collect all the samples from this uh, asteroid. And there is going to be another 
rendezvous with an asteroid, and I'll speak a, a, a bit uh, in a second. And we saw unsuccessful landing of Russia's Luna 25, which was the first lunar mission by Russia since 1976. The moon is hard to land on. Uh, we know it in Israel. And we saw a successful mission from India with a small rover that uh, successfully landed, soft landed on the moon. And uh, like I said, there is another exciting mission to an asteroid. This time it will be uh, an all-metallic asteroid, uh, some uh, celestial uh, body that we never examined from a close distance, so it was launched uh, successfully. Again, this is a, a demonstration of the cooperation between the government and the private sector because the spacecraft is from NASA and the launcher is from SpaceX. This time it's the Falcon Heavy. So, uh, again, this was an amazing year in space. Uh, 2024 already is an amazing year in space, and it will be more amazing. So, you'll have to wait to next year's uh, space conference. And uh, in the unlikely uh, case of someone uh, wanted to connect with me, you have my uh, several ways of communication. So, thank you very much. Einstein once said, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. So I want to thank you very much, Mr. Inbao, for helping us learn a bit about the past. And before the next talk, a short announcement by Eyal Ben Ze'ev about this year's International Space University Space Studies Program. <laughs> Any ISU alumni in the crowd? Yeah? Oh, there are some. Okay, so the International Space University, if somebody doesn't know, is one of the best space universities in the world right now. And each summer they have uh, a very strong space course. And this summer it's in Houston, Texas. Israel every year sends people over there. And we want as many Israelis to go this year as well. If you have any question, if you're working in the space sector, if you're uh, researching in the space sector, if you want to enter the space sector and you want to learn more about ISU, the International Space uh, University and uh, Space Studies program in the summer, come and talk to me or to any one of the other alumni here in the crowd or outside. Uh, we have a big poster just near the elevator. You can catch us in the break and we'll tell you all about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eyal. And now let's talk a bit about space and humanity. In the following panel titled Remote Sensing in Support of Situational Awareness for the Civilian Sector, we'll hear about ways to harness satellite remote sensing for the good of the environment and life on our planet. I'm delighted to invite to the stage Ms. Dana Lynn Barnett, a senior satellite systems engineer at Elbit Systems to moderate the panel. Okay, good morning. So um, today we're going to talk about remote sensing, uh, helping the situational awareness for the civilian sector. And I'm very proud to invite my uh, fellow uh, panelists um, helping discuss this uh, important topic. As we've seen in the last uh, few months that uh, remote sensing is crucial in understanding what's going on, not just in our daily day-to-day uh, -day life, but also in emergencies uh, and human disasters. So I would like to invite Professor Noga Kronfeld Shore, Chief Scientist, Ministry of Ed Environmental Protection. Uh, Dr. Adi Nino Greenberg, Chief Scientist for the Israeli Space Agency. 
Dr. Tarin Paz Kagan, the Remote Sensing and Agroinformatical Laboratory, the Jacob Blaudstein Institute for Desert Research at the Ben Gurion University. Uh, Mr. Roish uh, Roi uh, Shilo, the founder and CEO at Planet Watchers Agricultural Intelligence for the insurance sector. And uh, Mr. Benny Maor, Senior Director, Head of Space Remote Sensing Business Unit at iStar Division in Elbit Systems. Okay, so welcome all and thank you for coming. As we look in the usage of the space uh, remote sensing in the last few months, I would like to ask you how does remote sensing help the civilian sector obtain the updated ground situational awareness? And I believe I would like to ask you, Tarin, um, to start. Thank you. So I think um, one of the images uh, that I saw at a few days after October 7, October 7 uh, was the image that was captured by Sentinel-2. I don't know if we can put this image. Oh. Uh, this can image shows... Never mind. Okay. This image shows the large amount of uh, damage that was caught uh, in those regions. You can see the, the large amount of area with fires. Uh, one of the things that uh, sentinel 2 capture is the uh, swear band, which is a highly relevant water absorption, but also can detect very clearly uh, fires. And in here, what you can see is you can see the area where we've got uh, the points of fire, car by car, ho house by house, which is, f of course, stunning, first of all. But in addition to that, it's emphasized the importance of remote sensing in monitoring uh, disasters like what we we have what happened in Israel in uh, uh, October 7. In addition to Sentinel 2, that just passed few hours after the attack on October 7, there are additional satellites, as mentioned previously, with uh, large amounts of information that can help us manage those area, rehabilitate them, and create a new environment that people can go back to their houses and uh, live in more, uh, more uh, uh, friendly or more uh, um, uh, accurate environment for them. So I think that the satellite system has a very, very important uh, aspect also in terms of managing area after disaster, as we currently see in here, but also for our everyday lives. Thank you. Um, Roy, yes, we look at this um, slide, which also shows us uh, uh, the mass damage in the agricultural areas. Perhaps you can help with your uh, intake on this. Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, first of all, as Tarin said, um, you know, satellites can be really useful, especially at this kind of times that you can see areas that it's very hard to reach to. Um, I'm from an Israeli startup, so I will speak mostly about the startup scene. Um, we have a lot of startups that are specializing in analyzing remote sensing data, satellite data. Um, some of, the, of, the, of those startups were able to assist after October 7th, uh, but if, you know, to be frank, not enough. And I think this is part of the, uh, of the topics that we want to cover today how we can establish you know, the flow of information from the industry, from the startups, from the academy, um, into where it's needed. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for now. Okay, Benny, can you help us also understand how would you look from an old industry or more maintained industry perspective? Yes, uh, so um, good morning everyone, or noon. Thank you for having me here. Um, um, as I said, I, am, um, I, I'm, I will try to represent the point of view of uh, the traditional uh, space industry. Uh, at Elbit Systems, we are a center of excellence for the last uh, 30 years. We are uh, for space remote sensing, and we are actually the ones that provide uh, the actual um, uh, imaging uh, payload um, and the camera that, um, that is um, going upstream and uh, providing all of this, uh, this kind of data. 
Um, I think that this uh, image is a very uh, good uh, illustration and a proof of concept of, uh, of uh, the capabilities uh, we can reach, we can have uh, from, from uh, space for this kind of um, uh, disaster areas. Uh, however, the disaster areas are singular points in time. And in order for, um, for being able to supply solutions for that, we need um, uh, payloads in space populating the low Earth orbit in a, in, a, in a way that will enable day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, data for customers worldwide. And then on those specific singular times worldwide that you have disaster, then they will be over there available to provide real-time um, uh, capabilities. Thank you. And, and Noga, perhaps from your perspective, as we look at this, uh, what can we do and use? I mean, is this just a chance that we have this image or that we can use it? Uh, so I think that uh, I'm the only one from the user's side. I, I'm, I'm not dealing with space or with the remote sensing. I'm the chief scientist of the Ministry for Environmental Protection. Is, and and uh, a major part of my role is to try and connect um, a science and a policy and uh, one of the main uh, gaps, I think, is the use of uh, data for decision making. Um, and many of, the, many of the decisions that we take uh, have a spatial dimension. And I think that one of the best uh, sources for spatial data is, is remote sensing and, and space satellites. Um, so, during the last uh, year and a half, Adi and I and other uh, chief scientists like Michal Levy from the Ministry of Agriculture have been working, trying to understand what are the abilities of, uh, of remote sensing and, uh, and on the other hand, what are the needs and how we can connect the needs to the abilities and in what way uh, we can create a, a data processing structure that will deliver the information that is gathered by remote sensing to decision makers like myself that don't really understand uh, space but want to use the, the information that is uh, created using remote sensing. So Adi, perhaps you can also add from your perspective Yes, thank you, so it's great to be here. Um, uh, following uh, what Nonga said, uh, actually we uh, had a long process and I think that uh, the first challenge was to bring space closer. This is how I call it because for us in the space uh, ecosystem, uh, space is uh, very common and understandable, but for other users uh, that works on the ground, um, it's not, uh, uh, it is not very clear. So bridging the gap is the first step. And we did, I think, we did a great process, if I may say. Um, and in a larger perspective, I think that uh, satellites are a long-term investment. Um, as long as they're active, they provide data, and you can uh, create great knowledge for various needs and, and a variety of users. And this is what, what we do in, in routine. We, we take the data and we try to figure it out and create knowledge and create database of, of, of uh, answers uh, to the needs that the users have. And when, when, when it comes to emergency times, we can benefit from all the hard work that we already did in the routine. So it is... Um, very important to um, to take all the, the the insights and all the knowledge that was uh, extracted from the data, and to to benefit it to update the situational awareness, especially in times like this. Um, the Israel Space Agency uh, considers uh, space-based um, remote sensing and Earth observation to be of uh, great importance, and we promote. Uh, satellite remote sensing uh, research. Uh, we have uh, international collaboration. Um, I can think of two major examples. We have the successful uh, Venus uh, satellite for uh, agriculture, uh, for precision agriculture and uh, environmental uh, um, 
monitoring together with CNES, uh, which is a very successful uh, project, and of course the um, joint research with the UAE Space Agency together with researchers from Tel Aviv and Khalifa Universities uh, for environmental monitoring. So I think that this is, this is, this is uh, what we are trying to, to, um, to achieve during routine and maybe um, in the next, uh, in the next um, step, I will uh, elaborate um, more about what we're doing in emergency times. Okay, so we talked about bridging the gap, and in the previous panel, they talked about the TRA levels. So how do we go for bridging the gap, and what, is there a difference um, in emergency times or in the Israeli sector emergency time? I will first ask you guys um, from the academy and from the industry on your intake. Um, so I think that there are uh, several aspects that need to be considered. So first of all, da data is available. We've got a lot of satellite and a lot of data and information that we can capture. But I think that the, the main part that needs to be um, uh, emphasized is how we translate this data to knowledge and how's the, how this data is transferred to the users, to the decision makers, to people that can use it and uh, have some uh, uh, decision about uh, uh, the use of it. Uh, I think it's becoming more and more accurate and more and more important when we are under a, a time like this, where we need something that is crucial, need to be uh, provided very fast, so we'll have uh, the ability to have a decision uh, about uh, things. Uh, additional aspect is the use of this information to rehabilitate area, and this is also very important because after the attack or after the, the damage was already caused, what we need to do is we need now to rehabilitate and build a new, uh, new environment. And for that, we need a lot of models and a lot of algorithms and a lot of information that will be translated accurately to the users. And this is, I think, the main step that currently missing. So we've got a lot of information, but it's not really available to most of the people, and we need to make it available. And we need to create a hub that will enable this data to be freely available to all users and all decision makers and all governments. I can emphasize it with one example, uh, that it's based on the agricultural system. So for example, in Israel, we don't have crop modeling uh, maps. Uh, and uh, this is something that came from the government, from the Agriculture Ministry, of, uh, 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 Agriculture Ministry, which needed a platform to monitor crops in Israel. And we took this uh, uh, opportunity and develop, and currently developing a models together with the Vulcani Center, research from Vulcani Center, on crop mapping of Israel automatically in near real time. This requires integrating information from multiply satellite developing the platform, inherit this platform into the GIS system of the government, of the Agriculture Ministry of Science, so we, they will be able to use it for uh, managing those areas. So I think that the main idea is to move from data available to knowledge that is available. So maybe I'll continue from here, from this point. Um, uh, so for us, as, um, a, a, as the industry, the traditional industry, uh, we have the responsibility um, to keep uh, providing these amounts of data uh, for, the, um, uh, for users and customers and, uh, and startups and application uh, developers to be able to do lots of uh, work on it. And I think that we are now, um, we're all um, in really exciting times because uh, we're at a point that at least um, after, after 30 years, you know, in, in, in um, uh, our industry are, uh, have been um, uh, solving um, the technological barriers um, uh, and we can provide uh, nowadays solutions uh, with regarding to spatial uh, resolution, to, um, to spectral depth and spectral uh, control and uh, spectral uh, slicing and providing whatever is needed in this, uh, in this uh, domain and also on the time domain and repetitivity and so on. But we have a limiting factor which is uh, the, um, the um, uh, costs. And I think that nowadays our big challenge is to be able to provide all of this amazing stuff 
uh, and uh, and do it in order to provide that we need to lower the cost and that's where we need to put our innovation and our um, uh, scientific teams and to find uh, innovative solutions for how to to do that because if we do that, the barrier is going to be very low because the launch prices, as we know, are, are going down and down. So we need also the payload prices to go down. And then we'll have many payloads, many spectral bands, many, um, many uh, data points. And, uh, and then grinding the data with big data, with AI, will provide uh, solutions to problems that we don't even know that are, exist now. Yeah, I, first of all, I agree. Uh, I think we, in a few minutes, like we established, we established uh, in our discussion that Israel has the, have the capabilities to launch, um, you know, satellites and um, payloads into space. We have the science, um, you know, to support the analysis of the data. Uh, we have users that need the data, um, and we have startups that can help in order to make this commercialized and. and uh, a service that is available and very simple to consume um, because basically in, in startups this is what we do. We just simplify data. You know, the data is already there, especially in remote sensing analysis. We just try to make it uh, easier to understand. And Israel being geographically a very small state, we are very well situated to use this data and to have full coverage of, of the, entire, uh, the entire country. Um, but as Tarin said, that's not the case. And even in, in agriculture, we don't have so many agricultural areas in Israel, but still we don't have good information about them. Um, my startup is working in North America. Over there, every field is mapped. And those are vast and huge areas. Um, and we are such a small country and we didn't do it yet. So I just think it's really a matter of decision and, and, you know, switching the, the mindset uh, because there is value in that. Um, and it's definitely an investment and not an expense. Um, and once we figure out what the users need, we have enough resources to, to deliver it properly. So let's talk about bridging the gap and, and finding these uh, users. How do we connect the dots between the potential uh, users and the analytics and the uh, technologies and how do we do this in the, in the last uh, so, so part, first, few months? First, I think we, we, we have to map the abilities and the needs, as, as I said, but this is not enough. Um, so people in Israel are considered early adopters of new technologies, but unfortunately, that's not the case at the government. It is much more difficult to persuade uh, the ministries to, to adopt uh, a new technology and stop using the, the old uh, techniques that they were using. So I think that uh, we have to watch for opportunities and uh, the fact that we worked for a relatively long time and uh, we got acquainted with all, all the abilities on one hand and the needs on the other, uh, actually enabled us to use this knowledge uh, when uh, urgent needs came up uh, due to the war. And uh, we realized that uh, there are several difficulties. First, there was a problem sending people uh, close to the border because of the danger. And we were trying to uh, uh, find uh, alternatives for um, uh, rescuing these people. So remote sensing was uh, something that um, attracted interest. And uh, we could relatively quickly demonstrate uh, the abilities. Uh, for example, one of the things that my ministry, or there are several things that my ministry is, is, is interested in, uh, damage to uh, nature reserves and open spaces, uh, pollution by uh, oil or heavy metals. And one of the things that we wanted to do very quickly was uh, the removal of asbestos roofs, uh, both in the south and in the north, because once asbestos is uh, bombed or burned, uh, the cost of removing it is uh, in order of magnitudes uh, higher and the risk is very high. 
so to start with, the Ministry of Agriculture and my ministry, Environmental Protection, started sending people to look for roofs, but then when we showed that we can actually relatively easily um, detect the, the, the asbestos roofs from space, um, it, it, re it, it makes the, 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 the uh, work much faster and much, much more efficient. And we are now starting to promote uh, asbestos uh, um, uh, removal using remote sensing for, for detection of, of the areas that are suspected as asbestos. And the other thing is um, damage to a uh, nature reserve. Uh, we, we can't fly drones now uh, next to the borders. Uh, and we don't want to send uh, cars into the nature reserves to see if something happened because they, that causes damage by itself. So by looking at the NDVI and changes in, uh, in the land, we can actually locate the suspected areas and uh, approach them specifically and try to understand and improve the detection of areas that need to be reconstructed. We also have to um, allocate uh, money for uh, recovering these areas. So we have to get estimates of, of uh, the sizes of areas that were damaged. And this, is, this can easily be done with the remote sensing. So I think that once we will start using remote sensing now because of the urgency and the need, it will be much easier to extend and use other, uh, uh, to other uses in other ministries. And I hope that uh, this will happen now. Um, I would like to add a few uh, uh, things to that. Uh, first of all, as Noah said, um, satellites are um, our eyes uh, in space, and when we can send uh, people or drones or cars to a damaged area, um, we can use satellites. Uh, another benefit is that because they are always there, we can go back and forth and to detect changes and to create insights and to create maps that um, a change over time, so it is very important for our users. Uh, so what we did, because in uh, um, over the, the last uh, year and a half, we worked with all these ministries and local authorities, we created a very large database of needs of all the users. And on one hand, and on the other hand, we created um, uh, a list of all the satellites, of all the technologies, uh, the remote sensing technologies, whether it's SAR or hyperspectral or whatever, uh, that we can benefit from. So we came in very, uh, um, uh, very, uh, very fast to the to the situation. And when the pro the, the Tukuma project was formed or established, uh, we knew very quickly that we can contribute to this important effort. So we created this cross-ministerial team together with Michal Levy, together with uh, Elad Segi, that is here from the Israel Space Agency and others. Um, and we try to, to detect um, the most important needs. And it's not, it's not so easy because there are many needs that are important, but we try to combine them with the needs that are um, low-hanging low, um, uh, uh, low fruits, so we can quickly achieve um, um, uh, a response or capability to, to, to help in these needs. So the combination between these um, needs uh, I think that this is one of the things that we are going to work on very quickly. Uh, of course, we need a budget, uh, and I think that the list is only uh, getting uh, long as we talk, but this is very important. So I think that satellites has, um, have a, a very important role in this, in this war. So uh, if we look about, and, and let's imagine for a second that we have we have the budget, we have the money. Uh, in the next emergency, whether it's a natural emergency or, or anything, you know, from 
global uh, um, disease or whatever, something needs, and we need this data. How do you see, what's your dream of, of this whole happening very quickly? I mean, in each of your perspective uh, areas, how do you see this case following? Like, what do you do? Um, from my perspective, first of all, I think that in order to be ready in an emergency, we really have to use this on, uh, on routine. Um, and hopefully when emergency comes, the use will keep feeling like a routine because it's already being used and we don't need anything else and the data is already there. Um, as I said before, the satellites are always there. They also go back in time, which is critical many times. Uh, drones cannot do that, uh, for example, or uh, airplanes. Um, so I really think that there should be a um, significant investment in building the capabilities and creating the connections that are needed in order to create the, the data. I don't think, by the way, that it's uh, so expensive. Um, and then just keep updating the information layers. But I think most importantly, everything has to come from the users. There are so many things you can do with remote sensing, if too, too many things, uh, many times, and once we know what needs to be achieved, we can make sure that it happens. Um, and many times you'll find that, uh, you know, startups or people, uh, like my startup, for example, is doing something very different, but can I, uh, I don't know, detect, uh, you know, damaged um, roofs? Yeah, okay, it's not what we do, but we can do it. And if we can create a community that can share, you know, codes and analytics and continue to improve that, um, I think everyone will benefit. Yes, so, so uh, as, as, as we, as you're mentioning, um, yes, the capabilities are, are immense. Um, in our company, we have um, a, a lot of electro-optical uh, solutions for airborne uh, missions. We can provide uh, detection of um, a vast amount of materials from space using hyperspectral uh, imaging, and and it's it's endless. When you when you talk uh, on, on 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 spectrum, then uh, it's endless what you can do from from remote. And I think that the the vision should be that um, that um, we will get to a point that the space is democratized. So so um, the many many uh, dispersed uh, customers can have access to all of this um, uh, uh, depth of, of data. And the way to do that is, um, is to aggregate uh, and to do partnerships and, and to get together and, and on, le on levels of countries, because it has to be on level of levels of countries, um, and, and, and put those customers together and, and, and aggregate the financing um, um, under agreements, and then you can you can build up uh, projects that can uh, uh, can that can launch this kind of uh, capabilities. Um, and another way of doing that is, um, and, and there is going to be a panel uh, after after lunch uh, about this, uh, is is by um, combining the defense um, uh, industry and uh, the defense side of the government and uh, uh, civil uh, applications and, um, and uh, finding uh, dual use uh, for existing and future um, uh, remote sensing uh, platforms. If I can add, so I think that there is some pipeline that need to, to go, we need to go through. So first of all is the data, and the data needs to come from a fusion of different sensors with different special spectral temporal resolution. I think that uh, today we have the ability of working with hyperspectral satellites from different uh, countries that uh, launch hyperspectral satellite, which is very, very important in uh, terms of detecting and uh, using it for different application in remote sensing. The abilities now are available, which is something uh, a few years ago we can just dream on. Uh, so first of all is the data and the ability to fuse this data. Second of all is uh, to, to create that this data will be available, as mentioned previously. I think that the most, uh, and very, the most complicated part is uh, to create the models and to create the algorithms and to develop the approach. Uh, in the previous session, they mentioned, for example, uh, the use of a uh, satellite to detect chips and goats in grazing systems. So the main effort is to develop the system is to develop the application, the models, the accuracy, and this is usually requires a lot of additional infrastructure. 
sensors on the ground, additional information from flux tower or from whatever we want to monitor. And then to take this information, which need to be very accurate and very reliable, and transfer this information to the users. So I think that there is a very clear pipeline that needs to be applied, and we are somewhere in the middle in those pipelines. Um, I'd like to add a very practical uh, thing that I think that should happen and actually started uh, already. Uh, as, as ministries, we don't understand in space or uh, in remote sensing, and we need someone that can uh, answer on our questions, like uh, Elad and, and, and uh, Adi are doing, so I can come to someone with the needs, and they are the ones who will give me the solutions because even if I know something about space or remote sensing and I issue a call for uh, proposals, I don't have the ability or capacity to judge them. And therefore, I think that there should be, as, as happening now, a governmental unit within uh, this Israeli space agency that work with uh, the, uh, the ministries and help us use remote sensing more efficiently. So uh, I think I want to thank you all. I mean, we saw today um, the uh, infrastructure and the users and the potential, and, and we know that there's a great work that is underway, uh, also helping uh, during uh, the Tkuma uh, Directorate and in other um, cases, and it's my hope that next year we can come with an even bigger message showing how this infrastructure is already in place and how it is uh, helping us uh, in our daily life. So I want to thank you all, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ms. Danaline Barnett and the panelists for this very interesting discussion. And now, let's move on from imaging satellites to communication satellites. This following panel of experts will discuss the future of satellite communications. Heading the panel will be Professor Meir Ariel, who head the new Space Center of Tel Aviv University and the Director General of the Herzliya Science Center, a high school that launched the first Israeli CubeSat. Professor Ariel, you're welcome to invite the panel participants. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the satellite communication uh, panel. Satellites uh, play a major role in uh, modern communications, enabling a wide array of services uh, that have become an integral part of our daily lives, such as high-speed uh, transmission of audio, of data, of uh, video. Uh, we are holding today a panel discussion uh, focusing on uh, the capabilities that lower Earth orbit and geostationary satellites provide to the communication market, and what are the cutting-edge technologies for ensuring global, fast, as well as extremely secure communication. I would like to invite uh, our panelists to go on stage. Uh, Mr. Shmuel Leckler, Director of Communication Satellites at MBT uh, Space Division, Israel Aerospace Industries. Shmuel. And Mr. Roy Soffer, Senior VP Engineering at AST Space Mobile. Mr. Moshe Golani, CTO at NSLcom. And uh, Professor uh, Yaron Oz, Head of the Center for Quantum Science and Technology and former Rector of Tel Aviv University. Uh, thank you everyone for taking part in the, this discussion. Uh, communication satellites uh, could cover uh, extensive geographic areas, overcoming the limitations of ground-based infrastructure, but uh, LEO and GEO uh, satellites have different roles, and uh, choosing the right network will depend on the requirement and application of the mission that is being served. Uh, the first question is, is to Shmuel. Uh, a repositioning of uh, the geo satellite market is required in line with the high capacity presented 
by the deployment of Leo Mega constellations, such as, as uh, Starlink, for example, and Kuiper, and other uh, uh, networks. So, um, how is the aerospace industry in general and geo uh, satellite manufacturers like your company, in particular II, adjust their product line for this uh, next level of communication? Shmuel. Thank you, Mayor, for the introduction. Uh, with your permission, I would like to start with uh, uh, draw one. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, could you put the, uh, the slides of uh, Shmuel? Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I am a director for communication satellites at IIA Space Division. Uh, at IIA Space Division, we uh, design, develop, manufacture, launch, and operate all variety of satellites, like communication satellites, observation satellites, radar and electro-optical, small sat mainly for constellation, and research satellites. Uh, the the car, our current development for high-end communication satellites is DRAW-1. DRAW-1 is a, a very, very advanced satellite. And, sorry, I don't see the... This is the, the scope of the satellite, the communication satellite at the four west position, the, the position of uh, Israeli uh, ITO coordination, uh, transponders, uh, KUK and, and S-band. Uh, we can uh, support all kinds of uh, frequencies, but this is the frequencies for this satellite. We have also fully digital payload. It's like a big router. I will elaborate later on. And uh, we have also optical telescope for clouds recognition. It's very advanced uh, fields for communication satellites. And the dry mass is about two ton, with the propulsion at 4.5 ton, and the launch provider is uh, SpaceX. You can see the scheme of the satellites. Uh, we have uh, two lines of uh, communication satellites platform. One is the Amos 4000, like for Amos 4, Amos 6, and the current draw one. It's, uh, the payload mass is about one ton. Uh, payload, uh, all the power is about uh, nine kilowatt. Uh, launch mass is up to 5.5 ton, and up to 10 steerable antennas that support all frequency bands. Uh, the propulsion system can be like a car, a chemical, electrical, or hybrid. And uh, in other end, we have a new platform, small platform, mini communication satellites. The name is MCS Mini Communication Satellites. Uh, the payload is about 200 kilograms, uh, power about 3 kilowatt. Launch mass is uh, 800 kilograms, and the driver to uh, the low mass, it's of course uh, that we are using uh, electrical propulsion. Uh, common capabilities for both two satellites are uh, that we can implement on board the satellite a multi-band uh, multi frequencies. Uh, all digital payload, it's line, like one big router. We call it smartphone because we can do everything on board the satellite. I will elaborate later on. Uh, full flexibility and connectivity due to the fact that we are using a digital payload. And it's, uh, we can put on board the satellite applications like smartphone. It's uh, compatible for all commercial launchers. And uh, we have all, also inherent cyber protection in the ground segment and the space segment. Um, for the issue of uh, geo satellites, uh, as Mayor uh, mentioned before, uh, so, uh, in one end, we have started to, to uh, develop the, this small platform uh, that it's uh, on board the, the, this platform, we have a fully digital payload and it's fully flexibly, flexible. And uh, we use on board the satellite, uh, the digital payload and big reflectors, so we can increase dramatically the capacity of uh, the satellite. In other end, we have started to develop small platform that can fit for constellations, and uh, we can uh, offer to other customer boats the, the big platform and 
the small platform. So we see that this uh, bot two platform uh, can uh, meet the, all the requirements of uh, our uh, customers. And uh, we see that the Leo Constellation and the Geo Communication Satellites are complementary solutions. Thank you. Uh, the demand for uh, space channels is uh, further increased by the widespread adoption of terrestrial uh, uh, wireless telephony. So, Roy, can you take a minute and tell us about your company? Sure. Um, so, ST is a public company. Uh, we founded uh, seven years ago with a mission to connect uh, the unconnected. We are using space, which is the ultimate coverage to, 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 to access any corner of the planet with the ubiquity of five billion cell phones that we can scale and we can be a uh, 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 bridge the gap of the, of the connectivity without the need of any terminal. Uh, so basically we started the revolution of direct to the cell uh, uh, communication. Uh, our phased array uh, is, uh, is actually uh, connected. You can, you can move to the next slide, you can see that. Uh, the, the, the phased array is actually connected uh, uh, to the um, uh, uh, to people beyond, live beyond the terrestrial network and uh, or in dead zone. Uh, uh, investment uh, wise, we raise, uh, in order to achieve uh, this uh, mission, uh, over the year we, uh, we, we raised more than uh, $1 billion. Uh, the, the, the biggest uh, wireless companies uh, uh, are, uh, are in our, uh, a part of our investment. We have a Vodafone, a Rakuten, AT&T, Google as a, a smartphone manufacturer and also investing in the company. Uh, so basically what you can see here, we are building spacecraft. We are manufacturing spacecraft, a very big uh, spacecraft. Um, uh, we, we also have uh, our own uh, proprietary um, uh, gateway that on one hand interface with the standard uh, E-Node B, base stations, a grid of base station standard interface. The base station doesn't know that you communicate with any spacecraft. From his point of view, it's, uh, it's basically a terrestrial tower. Uh, and then we are taking the, the gateway, take, uh, take care for the Doppler shift, handover between spacecraft, uh, uh, delay variation, etc., etc. Spacecraft is extremely big. Uh, our current uh, test vehicle is uh, 64 uh, square meter. Uh, 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 so the field of view is big. It's 2,700 uh, tw uh, 2, uh, square uh, kilometers. And within the field of view, we have hundreds of, uh, of beams. Hundreds, uh, each beam is like uh, a needle uh, within that uh, field of view. Any cell phone, a, a handset uh, within that uh, illumination of the beam uh, can get an access to a broadband uh, communication. Uh, as the constellation is flying, we are doing a handover, extending the, uh, uh, the service time. Uh, from, but from user point of view, it's like, uh, it's like um, a, a roaming between cell phones, between uh, cell towers, excuse me. So uh, uh, leave some of the technical uh, aspects for later questions. Sure. Okay, let's go to, to Moshe. Take a minute to uh, tell us a few words about your company. So uh, NSLcom is a startup company in the new space uh, technology. Uh, we're developing an innovative deployable antenna. Uh, you can see our first antenna in the picture, uh, bottom right antenna was, this antenna was deployed to space uh, a year ago. Uh, and still holding on, this picture was taken in December uh, with some special camera we have on the satellite. So it still uh, keep its uh, shape uh, during, uh, uh, over time in space. We are also integrating uh, nano satellites um, and also now offering some uh, mini constellations uh, using our nano satellite uh, technology. Uh, our next product uh, regarding the antenna will be a fully gimbaled antenna, as you can see uh, in the picture, uh, which will have uh, two axes to go wherever we want uh, over the nano satellite. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Yaron, please say a few words about the, the Tel Aviv University Quantum Center. So, so uh, as you probably know, uh, we are witnessing what we call the second quantum revolution. The first one was about 100 years ago when the theory was discovered and uh, it was actually also applied. And now we have uh, capabilities of manipulating uh, quantum light and quantum particles much more effectively. And so you can hear in the newspapers about all these developments. The center at Tel Aviv University is the umbrella under which we perform all the research and uh, technology developments at Tel Aviv. They are typically in the field uh, four areas. 
One of them is called quantum computation. That means basically building, it's the hardware, and also developing algorithms for quantum computers. The second one is quantum communication, which is the one we are going to discuss a little bit more. Then there is something called quantum sensing and also quantum, uh, quantum materials. We are active in all uh, these fields. Uh, in addition, we are also in charge of uh, all the academic training in this field. Actually, it's a pretty tricky field to train because on the one hand you have the physicists, but on the other hand you need the computer scientists, and so you have to bridge the gap between communities. Uh, we have uh, more than 20 labs at the university. They are in physics, chemistry, engineering, and in computer science. And we have several flagship uh, projects. One of them is the quantum key distribution in uh, space that we are going to elaborate on. The others are related to uh, implementation of uh, quantum information processing units using uh, quantum photonics. Thank you, Aaron. A simple question to Roy, and please be brief because we want to make it uh, in time for lunch. Uh, what do you think are the biggest business opportunities in low Earth orbit communication today? Yeah, so direct to sell. <laughs> uh, we, are, uh, we are in an era that uh, uh, totally rely on data. We totally rely on access to knowledge. Uh, um, uh, we don't have uh, uh, any ability to, to connect uh, uh, most of the, uh, of the humanity. Uh, uh, Vodafone uh, CTO say it's either uh, AST or no connectivity when he discussed uh, uh, the connect the unconnected. I totally agree with him. Basically, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, five billion uh, uh, cell phones in circulation. Uh, uh, most of them getting in and out of connectivity constantly. 45% uh, uh, of the humanity doesn't have coverage at all. So we are uh, uh, addressing a market of uh, more than uh, one trillion dollar a year, uh, and the ability to access that is not with the terrestrial network. It's not practical. Even a space communication that requ requires terminal, you cannot scale it. You cannot carry terminal. You carry cell phone anywhere that you're going. So if you will solve three uh, uh, basic uh, goals. Uh, uh, we believe that we'll be able to, to solve a very, very complex uh, problem for humanity. We need global coverage. With AST, we'll be able to do that with about uh, 100 spacecraft uh, of Block 2. Uh, uh, you need to access a standard cell phone, an uh, unmodified cell phone with a standard terrestrial uh, frequency. We just demonstrated in Blue Ocus 3 our test vehicle. We uh, communicate with the 5G data race directly to the cell phone. Uh, and then uh, you need a broadband. So, so, could, could, you, could you elaborate on the technology aspects of, of providing a seamless uh, connection between terrestrial and space networks? So in order to, to do that, we, the, the, the solution uh, should be very, very unique. Uh, I, I, we, we address uh, so many uh, technology aspects, um, uh, but if I need to choose one, is, is the array. In our, in our business, in our application, size is matter. In order to make it uh, commercial, in order to address uh, uh, capacity, uh, we need a very, very large uh, uh, phased array. And, and you need it in order to have a single to uh, ratio. You need a big uh, uh, field of view if you have a, a very wide uh, a, a scanning angle of the antenna. Uh, you need a very narrow uh, a beam. With the large antenna, you can have a narrow beam, so we will not interfere either. You'll be able to do a frequency reuse. Uh, and, and, and also very, very low side lo level. Once, uh, and, and, but in order to, to have uh, such a solution, you need to address so many aspects. You need, first of all, mechanism. How you design such a big uh, mechanism, how you deploy, how you stow it, uh, how you simulate it on Earth. You need to have a power system. Uh, 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 on one end to, 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 to um, optimize to death uh, a power consumption, but uh, uh, to have a very, very uh, a, 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 a efficient power consumption in order to have the capacity to generate efficient. We design our own ASIC. Uh, uh, we are partnering uh, with TSMC, uh, uh, most advanced uh, a, a, a process node, in order, because, just because there are no solutions like that out there. Uh, you need a very wide bandwidth, you need to address all the cellular a, 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 a bands. Um, uh, AOCS is a very complex to fly, uh, a 64 square meter a, a solution. Later on, we'll have a, a 15 by 15 meter array. This is a, a very, very complex a, a problem. So in order to achieve uh, such an a, a ambitious uh, solution, but not only uh, uh, to demonstrate a, a, a test vehicle, a connection to a cell phone, but actually to have 
hundreds of cells uh, uh, with, with uh, a huge amount of capacity, you need to optimize in a very, uh, in a lot of um, um, aspect from thermal solution, uh, a power consumption, a, a, a bandwidth and so on and so forth. Uh, but once you're doing that, uh, uh, the, the, the market potential is immense. Uh, um, and, and we believe that we're in the right direction for there. Thank you. Uh, Moshe, uh, your company's solutions are based on miniature satellites, nano satellites, 6U, 12U, maybe up to 16U. Now, as the skies become denser and satellites become larger in mass, what role, if any, can nano satellites still play? <clears throat> so that, that's very interesting because we've seen a lot of uh, competition uh, this year, uh, specifically in the nano satellite uh, segment and also improvement in uh, standardization. And I think the, the, the reasons are um, because nanosatellite is still a good choice uh, if you want to do some technology demonstration for key components for the bigger uh, constellations. You don't want to find out if you deploy uh, 300 satellites that uh, some communication part uh, has to do some improvements. Uh, so still nanosatellite is a good choice. Uh, this standardization is better than in bigger satellites. So it makes it more affordable to go to space with uh, nanosatellites. Um, I think nanosatellites are also suitable for uh, bringing to use uh, applications to preserve uh, filing rights in space. Uh, you can do it uh, much more easily with nanosatellites. And I think also nanosatellites uh, are suitable today for uh, deep space missions. And we've seen more of that uh, lately. Thank you. Uh, the theme of this panel is connecting the dots. And I would like to focus on how the dots can be connected securely. So this is a question to Yaron. Uh, quantum computers are around the corner, and your uh, renowned uh, quantum physicist, uh, one, probably one of the very few here in the audience, nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, can you please explain what is the main threat uh, to secure communication posed by the post-quantum era? So quantum computers, they are based on uh, uh, quantum mechanics, while classical computers are based on what we call classical mechanics. So they are much more powerful, and in principle, they can perform a very, complex, very complex tasks, optimization, etc. But one thing that we know for sure that they can do is that they can break uh, encryptions that are already been used and actually uh, used very effectively, like the RSA. And they can do it very quickly. And this poses a, a great threat to security because the whole idea of encryption is based on the fact that classical computers cannot decrypt the information quickly. Now, some people think that, okay, it might take a while that quantum until quantum computers will be developed, and that's true. But the problem is that there are already institutions that are collecting the data. And once they will have these computers available in a certain number of years, this data is still relevant, and that's why uh, NIST, for instance, is now already establishing new standards for, uh, for security. So, in, so the, the short answer is quantum computers can manipulate a huge amount of data and very quickly, and they can do it much, much better than classical computers. So, a follow-up question to, to Yaron. So, what, what is exactly the relation between quantum uh, technology and satellites? White space. Right, so quant quantum theory offers something very, very strange and unique. This is called no cloning theory. In, in ordinary life, you can copy a message, you can have, you can listen, you can record it, you can have as many copies as you want. In quantum mechanics, you can have only one copy. That means that if I listen, I, or I am destroying the message, the original message. It cannot be that I will listen and still the message will pass. Based on this, people develop what we call quantum communication. Quantum communication is a channel, it's an optical channel, but it's based on the laws of quantum mechanics and you cannot listen to it. In principle, once you listen to it, you are going to destroy the message. People have already implemented that in fiber optics, but fibers have attenuation, and also you have to uh, place them, and there is another issue that uh, because of that you need to have repeaters, and repeaters can be, it's difficult to develop them in quantum mechanically. So therefore, if you go to free space, there is a chance, or there is a technology that uh, 
you can use at, lo at long distances, and the only thing you do, you need to do is to uh, pass a key. Once you did that securely, that's, then you are 100% secured, not just against classical attacks, but also against the threat of quantum computers. So, so what do you think? What will it take to, to build a, a global uh, system for quantum communication in free space? W what are still the challenges? Right, so in order to develop quantum network, there are a couple of things that we need to understand a little bit better. First of all, the, the attenuation or the impact of turbulence or noise on quantum communication channel is something that we still need to understand better because quantum mechanics is based on all kinds of delicate properties that you need to preserve if you want to have the communication channel working properly. There are aspects of payloads that you need to think about, and there are also aspects of protocols. Once you have, set, once you have satellites, you can only pass a finite key. Finite key, there are issues uh, of security that you need to analyze. And last but not least, it's the thing that I was telling you already about fiber optics. Normally, you can enhance a signal by quantum repeaters. This is not what you can do in quantum mechanics trivially because you cannot clone the signal. There are other clever ways that people are thinking about. So therefore, the architecture that we will need is going to be a little bit different. Thank you. Uh, Shmuel, uh, satellites has, has long been uh, flying computers, uh, enabling to upload software while in orbit. And they can also adjust their mission accordingly. Now, software-defined radio, SDR, is a system where components that conventionally have been used, that have been implemented in, in analog hardware, such as mixers or filters or uh, amplifiers or modulators, are now implemented in, in software instead. Uh, could you enlighten us on how SDR is used as a new design driver for GEO and LEO missions? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. So first, II is a worldwide tech leader for this digital program, programmable uh, uh, payload. Uh, it fits, uh, our digital payload, it fits for geo communication satellites and for Leo constellation. Uh, we are started to implement it f at, uh, in Amos 4. Uh, it's working for more than 10 years. And uh, in the current satellite, Draw 1, we implement a uh, new genera generation of digital payload. And uh, we have started to develop uh, the next generation of digital payload uh, with AI capabilities. So uh, this is a real SDR, soft, software defined radio, because we can put applications on board the satellite, not only before the launch, we can do it during the mission life of the satellite after the launch. We can implement a lot of applications like spectrum monitoring on board the satellite. We can implement modem on board the satellite. We can enhance the link budget of on board the satellite, and we can also implement communication nets on board the satellites. So this is the reason that we call it the smartphone, because it's very easy. It's very easy way to upload the new applications, and uh, except of our lines for uh, satellites uh, uh, platforms and uh, ground station, we have a, a new business line for new applications and it fits for all other customers, and it fits for uh, Leo communication satellites and Geo communication satellites. By the way, it's not only for communication uh, applications. We intend to use it for our observation satellites and other small uh, constellations for a lot of applications, and uh, it's a very uh, powerful machine for us. Thank you. Uh, Roy, uh, you're representing uh, an American company with an R&D center here in Israel. Uh, this is quite unique in the uh, uh, space industry in Israel. Um, could you pr briefly tell us what is AST Design Center in Israel is developing these sure. days? So first of all, Israel has been blessed with a lot of talents. We have talents in RF, we have tal talents uh, doing uh, uh, um, uh, phased array, uh, ASIC design, FPGA design, and, and, and very important, and I think we proved that, uh, Israeli folks are very, very resilient and never miss any delivery. AST uh, management recognized that. Uh, in fact, uh, Israel is the biggest R&D center uh, uh, of AST. We are doing here, uh, together with our affiliate sites in uh, 
uh, UK and India, all the payload, all the communication uh, aspects. Uh, I have a system uh, a, a, a team responsible for architecture, a CONOPS, a FPGA, ASIC design. Uh, we're developing the antenna here. Uh, the entire phase, there anything from the ground, uh, uh, ground gateway to the uh, uh, via the feeder link to the antenna, uh, cellular antenna side is being developed here, here in Israel. Uh, recently, we started to develop also the, uh, uh, the ground control uh, of the payload, all the scheduling aspect of the service, uh, a very, very complex uh, a, a problem uh, in order to achieve uh, such mission. By the way, it's not only R&D. Um, in fact, we're also uh, 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 producing here in Israel. Uh, we are producing all the PCBA um, and, and testing and qualifying all the PCBA that are going to the, uh, to the spacecraft before the, uh, uh, we, uh, the integration in our uh, uh, Gigafab in uh, Midland. Uh, so once you're blending together R&D and production, beautiful thing happens. So you think in, in the next conference you will be able to use the global satellite phone uh, that operates on a single uh, network? Uh, so the, the, the model is that actually we are interfacing, uh, you, you, you can see our um, uh, uh, investor, it's AT&T and, uh, and, 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 and Vodafone and, and, and huge amount of uh, uh, logos in our uh, 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 memory of understanding. Uh, the idea is that we are, uh, uh, we, we are bridging between their network, uh, their core uh, network to the cell phone uh, and, and letting them manage uh, uh, the network themselves. Okay, uh, last question to uh, Moshe. Uh, what are the, the regulatory challenges that companies like your company uh, face in, in the Leo market? And, and how regulation can help companies, startup companies like yours penetrate the market? Yeah, so first of all, regulation is always behind the technology and, uh, and the market. Uh, we've seen that. In the Leo uh, regulation, there are some unique things that uh, are not, not existing in the Geo uh, regulation. Uh, first of all, there are much more uh, degrees, uh, number of degrees of freedom. Uh, there's not only uh, orbital position, there's uh, altitude, inclination, uh, number of satellites, number of satellites per, uh, uh, per orbit, etc. And the second thing is everything is global, it's not uh, regional. You cannot just, uh, like in geosatellite, uh, you know, um, look at one region. Um, and and what, we've see, what we see is that a uh, few companies are taking advantage of this process and actually registering a huge number of satellites. Um, therefore, I think the main task of the regulatory organizations like ITU is to be able to, um, to control this and to a little bit, you know, uh, lower the number of satellites registered uh, and allow the skies to be a little bit less uh, dense. Okay, the, the, the market size of satellite communication is estimated at about $200 billion in 2024, and according to some market studies, it is expected to reach $300 billion uh, within the next uh, five years with the deployment of the mega constellations. I think that uh, we have maybe a minute for a question from the audience. I see that you're all very hungry. A question or two. And uh, so if not, uh, I, um, I would like to, to thank our panelists for a profound and interesting discussion and see you all in the next panel after lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Ariel, and a big, big thanks to the panel experts. Let's break for a 45 minutes lunch, which will provide an opportunity for all of you to network and to make some discussions. We'll meet here back in 45 minutes for more exciting panels and talk.
I'm happy to see everyone smiling after your lunch. So before we commence with the talks and panels, we have a short announcement. Israel's unique space sector is a combination of industry, startups, finance, and other business organizations. Today, we announced a new Israel Space Forum that will serve as an umbrella to all of these verticals. The forum will be led by Rakia in the Israel Space Agency with professionals advisory by the Israel Manufacturing Association, the Israel Innovation Authority, Earth and Beyond, Astra, and the Israel Export Institute. Let's watch a short movie and then I'll invite to the stage the forum representatives to say some words. We're launching the Israeli Space Forum, a groundbreaking initiative set to cultivate the thriving space industry and propel our space ecosystem to new heights. We view the space industry as a key driver for economic and social growth in the state of Israel. The forum is a crucial component of the agency overall strategy. Empower the civilian space industry by offering essential services and fostering knowledge sharing and networking. Launching this forum opens up fresh opportunities to advance and promote Israeli technologies in the global arena. To support innovation and deep tech with the potential to positively impact our planet. We're bringing together key players shaping the ecosystem of the space industry in Israel to lead this forum. With the brilliant minds we have in our country, Israel has the potential to send at the forefront of global innovation in the exciting field of space industry. Transforming Israel to a space tech nation and inspiring the new generation of innovators in the space ecosystem. The Israeli Space Forum is positioned as the flagship of the space industry in the country. We look forward to having you on board. I'd like to invite to the stage Ms. Hadar Vernik, CEO of Rakia, and Ms. Ortal Khazout, Head of Business Development for the Israel Space Agency. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. The Israel Space Agency, especially in these challenging times, is focused on empowering Israeli space companies, not only by proactively expanding global business efforts, but also by enhancing collaboration within the local ecosystem. We strongly believe that the establishment of the Israeli Space Forum will fortify all four vertices, industry, entrepreneurs, investors, and the space agency, and will open up the market for new players and new opportunities. The time has come for the Israeli space industry to work as a whole and bring to our table the talent, the knowledge, and the development of the industry together. Thank you. Two years ago, during the AX1 mission to the ISS, the Rakia mission successfully introduced a groundbreaking approach of open access to human spaceflight mission for the public in Israel. Dozens of experiments took part in the Rakia mission, which served as an innovative platform for hundreds of entrepreneurs, scientists, companies, and organizations making a significant impact. We recognize our ability to serve as a bridge for Israeli companies and entrepreneurs to the international and local industry to promote collaborations and to remove barriers to new level space stations and beyond. Today, we are establishing the Israeli Space Forum to continue developing the ecosystem of the space industry in Israel. We believe in collaborations. We've brought together leading entities, each contributing their unique expertise to the innovation, development, and the promotion of Israel's space ecosystem. 
Together, we will create opportunities, find solutions, and advance the space industry. Entrepreneurs, companies, investors, this is the place for you. Thank you. The Forum Lunch uh, event will be held on April 2nd at the Paris Center. For more details, scan the QR code on the screen or in the ex uh, uh, exhibition hall and register. So thank you so much, Hagar and Ortal. Resuming our program, Mr. Tal Inbal will return to the stage to moderate our next panel on dual use new space, new challenges, where he will discuss the challenges in the new space era. Tal, the stage is yours. Okay, it feels like the second time today. Uh, we, we are going to have a very interesting panel on uh, dual-use uh, space applications and uh, we'll discuss uh, uh, some issues uh, regarding to, uh, to this field of uh, activity in space and I would like to invite a very distinguished uh, panelist and encourage you to uh, read about their bio uh, on the website of this conference. Uh, I'll start with uh, Jasmine Inbar, she is a vice president of uh, Earth Observation and Corporate Development uh, at Astera. Yeah. And Professor Ran Genosar, he is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the Technion, co-founder and president of Ramon Space. Uh, Brigadier General Uri Oron, director of uh, Israel Space Agency. And Itamar Shahar, who is a Chief Project Officer at uh, ISI ImageSat International. So, uh, first, uh, thank you for uh, being here. And uh, our issue is a very interesting uh, one. And I'll uh, just uh, start uh, with uh, you, Jasmine. What do you think, in your eyes or views, what is uh, dual use in space? So first of all, nice to meet you all. I represent uh, Astera today. Uh, two sentences about Astera. Astera is the leading Earth observation company, um, specializing uh, in SAR, L-band insights. Uh, to detect subterranean uh, soil moisture. We work in more than 65 countries worldwide and are providing actionable intelligence to water utilities, government agencies, and uh, infrastructure companies. Dual use, in my opinion, is to use Earth observation, data, insights, analytics, uh, both in the civilian or commercial uh, market as well as in the defense uh, industry. Okay, uh, Ron, uh, could you please tell us uh, in uh, two sentences, uh, besides what your uh, take on uh, dual use, uh, what is Ramon Space? Thank you. Ramon Space makes uh, space-borne computers for operation in payloads and satellites. And um, going to uh, dual use. Uh, dual use is just a list of criteria on how to classify items. It's uh, one list out of uh, three uh, groups of classifications. Uh, one, classi one group is the munition list or the uh, weapons or military items. Um, the last group is unclassified items, commercial. And the middle group is dual use right in between. And um, if um, a device or system or a satellite uh, is above a certain threshold that's determined internationally by arrangements, uh, such as the Wassenaar arrangement, um, then it becomes uh, dual use and it is subject to export control. So dual use is just a method of uh, government to control international trading in uh, 
goods that relate to uh, military in general, uh, but in space in particular. Okay, Jasmine, uh, one more question to you. With your background as a defense contractor, Rafael, and now working in a somewhat uh, a startup uh, attitude uh, company, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the differences between working in two worlds? So yeah, it was uh, quite a change for me after 10 years at uh, the great Rafael Advanced Defense Systems. And um, it's been very, very exciting uh, at Astera for the last uh, two years. Um, first of all, we don't have a regulator, which is uh, very easy uh, for us to uh, handle processes. If I, if I take a process, for example, from ideation until the development of a new algorithm, then I see that it, is, it can be done in a very fast uh, pace. Um, as far as uh, some business aspects, then I see two major uh, differences. One is uh, with customer facing. In the defense industry, uh, there are you know, the best analysts that they will know what to do with the data or insights that we provide them with. Many uh, times we not going to know even uh, what they're going to fuse it with, what exactly is the pain in the end of the, of the, the road. Um, whereas uh, here in the, in the commercial industry, Testera, we take our customers hand in hand and make sure that everything is very intuitive. We provide them with an app to fully understand and most importantly solve their, their uh, problem because our customers today, many times they couldn't care less uh, whether, uh, uh, I mean, from what sensor the data was taken, it was to visit time, what resolution, they have a pain, they have a need that they need to solve and we are there to assist them all the way from, from zero to until it's completed. The second difference is with the, um, I would say, projects versus uh, SaaS. Uh, most defense uh, industries are mainly doing big projects. And a project can be one time, decent project. And uh, in the commercial industry, we work uh, in services, SaaS, uh, uh, software as a service, satellite as a service. And uh, the repetitiveness of the data and the insight is, uh, is crucial. OK, uh, one for you, uh, Itamar. Uh, can you please describe in, uh, in short what is uh, Imatsat? And then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, my question. Well, Imatsat is a company that, at the end of the day, delivers uh, uh, intelligence to its clients. Uh, we do it through Earth observation satellites, which we operate, uh, military-grade uh, satellites. Uh, but on top of that part of our portfolio, we uh, also have uh, national space projects. We have one extremely large project uh, constructing from bottom-up uh, a, a space uh, sector in Chile, uh, including uh, ground segments, space segments, etc. And right now, we develop more solutions that are based on the data that we collect, analyze and collect. At the end of the day, we are a company that uh, delivers the best possible intelligence based on Earth observation uh, satellites. OK, so uh, recently, I, I can tell you that, uh, in my opinion at least, uh, ISI was uh, reinvented uh, itself. And it's now a provider of satellites, not just uh, intelligence or data or solutions. Um, so yet, yet uh, most of the business are on the governmental sector. Uh, part of it is uh, in the defense. Where do you see the challenges, let's say, money-wise, uh, the cash flow coming from the civilian sector? Or is it enough money at the civilian sector that will require your uh, specific uh, uh, solutions? Image that was created to solve issues within the security sector. Uh, it has in reinvented itself uh, um, a few years back, uh, entering the new space 
industries and looking into more solutions that we can generate income from. And we were looking for, uh, for business cases in the uh, commercial sector. What I still believe that at least 80 to 85 percent of all the money going into the space sector, Earth observation at least, uh, comes from the defense uh, sector. And, and that leads kind of where uh, most of the space uh, providers or space information, for, uh, space data providers uh, go to. Um, at the end of the day, there is a paradox. Some of the applications that are needed with the commercial sector require the best or the, the cutting edge uh, of the Earth observation satellites. Very high resolution, uh, very high uh, uh, analytics uh, capabilities. And uh, uh, all this while the money that is offered or that is being generated from these applications is relatively low at this stage. We are still looking for the killer app or the alternative, we do believe in a long tail of services that is being based on the data that is accumulated within the companies. Okay, Uri, uh, I think that uh, you are a manif manifestation of a dual use because uh, of your uh, rich background in, in the military, being a Brigadier General at the Air Force, and you made a transition yourself, uh, leaving one system, which is of course a defense military uh, system, to the civilian one, so first on a, perhaps some personal note, the differences between working with, within the government at a civilian space agency and, um, and the Ministry uh, of Innovation, Science and Technology. And what do you think are the challenges, or uh, I don't want to say obstacles, of a viable, diverse and uh, civilian-oriented space sector in Israel? Yeah, hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's a very important panel. Uh, and it's actually connected between the previous panels. I think all of them, in some way or another, was related or could be related to the dual use. Even just going back to the issues that uh, were presented here by Earth's observation and other. Uh, so I think, I think the panel is a very, very important one. And, and, and You've got a longer memory than I. I think that's the first time that we are putting this one, the second time, on the table of the Ramon conference. Um, I will not go into the personal uh, uh, experience between the different organizations, uh, because uh, once I'll start, probably I will never end uh, about the personal uh, experience. But what I would like to emphasize that, uh, again, my belief that in space, basically, Everything is dual use. And the line between, let's say, military and defense and civilian is a broken line. It's not a strict line. What we need to do, and probably this is the challenge, is to understand the way we cross between those lines. And Professor Gonisal talked about the mechanism. I see it more as an attitude. Uh, and, and a way of thinking, because once you understand that from a national perspective, space is an asset that should bring value to everyone, defense as well as, as, uh, as, as civilian and commercial, of course, then you must understand that we need to, we don't have enough budget, money or resources to do them both. What we need to do, and I think it's, 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 it's relevant to everyone, even to the U.S., what we need to do is to understand what is the right way to cross those lines. That's the big challenge, because that's enter us to other areas uh, uh, that, that are very challenging, but um, if we won't be able to do this, this, this step forward and to, to formalize the right uh, mechanism to cross those lines between civilians, between commercial and defense, we won't be efficient enough. So I think, uh, in a way, that uh, the new space forum that was just announced is, is one of the keys to, to achieve those goals. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. There is the, 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 that's one. We need to have a space law in Israel. A space law could bring some regulation issues into the table and formalize the right behavior of the country. Uh, we need to formalize uh, 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 the way we, we act with, with, with partners international partners, but again, the first step is to understand that in space, everything is dual. Yeah. 
by nature. Uh, just mean Astera uses uh, space assets uh, of different kinds and, and, and origins to improve life on Earth. You save a lot of water. True. And uh, what could you tell us uh, about uh, taking your technologies and, and know-how and transfer it to the defense uh, sector? Yes, so we are very proud of the impact that we are creating worldwide by saving water. Um, and yes, uh, Stera started with uh, its main product for uh, leak detection. Uh, this is how we apply the l band SART that penetrates the ground to identify uh, leakages. But from there, we evolved and entered the soil moisture mapping um, arena. And uh, this uh, opened up many interesting verticals, such as uh, roads, so transportation, railways, you know, to prevent sinkholes, mudslides, landslides, uh, to the insurance market for underwriting purposes, in, um, emergency management, and more. But the same uh, soil moisture map can be also used by the commander for uh, maneuverability purposes. Um, and this is an interesting uh, shift. Uh, also, L-Band is the only band that penetrates tree canopies, um, and we are able to detect objects beneath tree canopies, and this is very interesting in the defense industry. So you, in your uh, list of uh, dreams, do you want to see an Israeli L-Band uh, satellite, for example? Yes. Or um, did, did you brought uh, your checkbook? Uh? <laughs> This is our main uh, challenge, by the way. Uh, we are missing data. Um, if you asked me two years ago, I would say we are swimming in data. The challenge is to extract the relevant insights out of this vast amount of uh, data. Today, I'm saying at Astera, the opposite. We know how to extract the relevant information. We know how to solve the problems. We seek data. And today we are using only two L-band satellites uh, operated by uh, the Argentinian and the Japanese space agencies, which are mainly operating for research purposes, and we are not at the top priority. Our customers are seeking more and more frequent visit time. There's super, I mean, there's so many verticals that can be relevant, but we cannot enter because we are missing this data. So if there is a company here that would like to join forces, with the support of Uri, of course, we'll be more than happy. Yeah, well, uh, I'm now switching to a, a one freestyle question to you still, Jasmine. Uh, is it possible for uh, some foreign companies to limit the data that is uh, going to be available to a company like yours, uh, since it, it could now serve the, the governmental or military um, uh, sector? So and, yes, and, 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 and is it a problem that uh, you it are can be preparing a for? In certain conflict zones, um, we faced it uh, in the past, uh, but uh, the majority part is okay, and we are able to provide the necessary insights. Once we'll have our own satellite, the sky's the limit. Yeah, or just you mentioned the, the long memory. We all, not, not all, some of us still remember 1991, the war, the Gulf War in Iraq, and at the time, the data from a meteorological satellite was limited because they didn't want to to give free of charge uh, data uh, for uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, Ron, uh, you and I recently uh, spent a little time talking about the huge investments of uh, SDA and the Space Force uh, in space in general and uh, in several aspects of using uh, computer uh, technology to, uh, to provide a huge data storage in space. Uh, how could you, or what could you see um, the uh, fusion of your expertise and the needs of, let's say, the largest and biggest spender in space, uh, the U.S. Uh, military space sector? So besides um, the technical capabilities, um, it's all about um, two things, uh, money and um, uh, international competition. And um, uh, SDA uh, activity in the United States 
has been made possible by um, a revolution in dual-use rules and uh, ITAR protection, uh, which is a protection of munitions, um, that happened in the United States uh, through the 2000s. And um, it um, led to the ability of the US government to uh, seek solutions from commercial companies. And the commercial companies, uh, as opposed to uh, defense contractors before them, um, could deliver goods and make uh, systems, make satellites and so on, that lie uh, or that, that fall under the um, dual use umbrella, um, which is good for them and for the rest of the world. And it enables also uh, foreign uh, non-US uh, entities to participate in a game. Of course, parts of the work that uh, the US government in uh, US Space Force and SDA are doing is classified and is uh, uh, classified under ITA. Um, but they created uh, a mechanism where uh, the rest of the industry is isolated from that and you can still be active in that domain without having to um, operate under ITAR uh, for every little thing, uh, which is good. Uh, the rest of the world is following and uh, this also opens doors for us and for others in places like Europe. Um, hopefully, Israel will also follow with a similar um, evolution uh, in the near future. Okay, so uh, by the way, this is the, the correct time to, uh, to say that on the JUICE mission to Jupiter, there are seven computers run by uh, your computer chips. Yes, in addition to that. In, in addition to the Acubit uh, clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, we're spreading uh, all over the solar system. Um, okay, Uri, um, how could you help newcomers into the space uh, arena, meaning Israeli new startups? I don't talking uh, necessarily about uh, a company that makes food for astronauts, but the technology-driven uh, uh, hardware. Uh, that uh, is going to be in space. It could be space cameras, it could be computer chips, uh, whatever. Uh, how could the Israeli uh, space agency ease their entrance into the space arena, which is by nature dual, du dual use, and to, let's say, to protect them a little bit from the, the organs that uh, regulate this field? So, so f I think, first of all, what we need to do is to define the real need. Um, and when I said that uh, everything is, or almost everything is dual use, then this specific uh, uh, company, uh, from our side in the space agency, we need to define the real need. Where is the real need uh, uh, to cross those lines? Uh, usually, probably, it will go um, all the way to what we call API or uh, the regulatory issues. Um, this is something that we are struggling with. Uh, hopefully, uh, by regulation, we'll be able to solve some of it. Not all of it, we'll be able to solve some of it. But again, I was talking about perspective and, and a way of thinking. Once we'll be able to discuss it with this specific startup, I believe we'll be able to at least help them to overcome some obstacles that they're probably not aware of. This is one thing. On the other hand, maybe from our perspective, we'll be able to generate uh, new ideas, let's say on the other side, of what, would, what they need or what they can do with their specific uh, technology. So the place that we are sitting could combine those two worlds. But again, I'm going back to the need. What exactly is the need? What exactly is, is, is the product? And where it is involved those two worlds of civilian and and, and defense, and then try to understand where exactly do you need to cross the line. Sometimes, I can tell you from my experience, sometimes really there is no line need, that need to be crossed. The only thing is you need to start walking. And, and sometimes the barriers are very, very low. They just frighten us, but they are very, very low. The lack of knowledge about the barriers stops some of those entrepreneurs. We could help them with that. So, what in, in uh, one or two sentences, what can you say to an com Israeli company 
that is afraid of uh, going into the defense uh, aspect of space uh, because they are afraid that uh, cooperation and collaboration with space agencies or funds from Europe, for example, uh, will not be possible for them. Well, I will say them, let's start. Let's start and, and start digging the right problems. Eventually, I believe those problems are probably going to be smaller than what we expected. Because I can tell you from the perspective of the, of the government, usually most of the organization really do believe that they need to help those, those companies. The only thing that we are lack the mechanism to solve those problems. So let's start understanding the questions. And maybe there will be one big question that we'll need to answer, but most of them are probably just a mechanism that we need to walk through. Okay. Jasmine, where do you like to see Astera in time frame of, let's say, five years from now or 10 years from now, other than uh, having an Israeli-made uh, L-band uh, satellite? This was decided here already. So unless an m and will uh, meet us uh, before, um, for sure to expand our portfolio uh, via uh, a satellite that um, can guarantee the certain capacity that we are um, at need for um, and, um, and, and spread into new markets, new territories, uh, the potential is, is there, for sure. Okay. Itamar, where, where do you see ISI in a decade from now? ISI should still and, and continue to build its position as a world leader in uh, the supply of, of uh, Earth observation um, uh, data. I think we should have a diversified uh, portfolio of satellites both EO and other forms of, of, uh, of satellites, including SAR, maybe Elbend, um, as well as um, uh, Elint, RF, all kinds, all sorts of uh, intelligence gathering uh, sensors from space, and expand our uh, capacity to provide uh, products which are extend beyond the defense, uh, the defense uh, market. Um, to commercial and civilian uh, needs as well, uh, depending on the, the actual ability to define what are the needs and where can we uh, find new markets uh, for our wares. Okay, Ron, not the same question. Uh, something else. Uh, what do you think about the, uh, the, the trend of, uh, of the U.S. military uh, Space forces and etc. Uh, of using uh, commercial off-the-shelf components like computer chips uh, and services. And when, where do you see uh, Ramon Space in that regard? So for us, uh, defense and non-defense markets are all the same because uh, space seems to follow what happens in the evolutions and revolutions on the ground. And uh, 20 years ago, when we started, we said software is everything. Let's build computers for space. And today, we say AI is everything. Let's build AI machines in space. And that's where we see ourselves heading, uh, big AI machines. Whether it's the defense world that uses them or somebody else, that's unrelated. However, um, the whole th one thing about dual use um, as opposed to um, military or defense equipment, um, defense customers, as well as many other customers, look for a return on investment and um, a set of uh, reliability uh, criteria that can only that cannot be answered by commercial uh, uh, systems. For example, you mentioned computer chips. Uh, computer chips made by the largest computer manufacturers on Earth are designed to be optimized for, for uh, operation on the ground, and they lack all the useless, t useless means uh, to protect them in space. So they tend to die in space after a year or two, uh, and that's been proven time and again. But if the customer, be it defense, for example, wants an operation of five to, for example, OFEC satellites have been operating 15 years in space. Um, 20, okay, 
now it's 20. Um, and um, uh, so most commercial uh, uh, optimized, very good, high performance computer chips from the ground uh, fail. So uh, you have to build something that's unique for space and compromise on the performance or cost or other things. And um, uh, for us, uh, that's where we see the future of what we do. Uh, we do things um, for space that are resilient and can operate and pro provide high level of artificial intelligence capabilities in space in 20 years, for 20 years, uh, for that length of time. And uh, they will, of course, not be competitive on the ground. So these are two different worlds. Okay, thank you. Just a short notice to the audience. I can see the clock. And uh, because of the time delays, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, Uri cut uh, 10 minutes. So I won't ask you another question. Uh, I just, uh, I'll just give you uh, the opportunity to, to give, uh, let's say, the answer to a question that uh, I didn't ask. Something that you think the audience should hear. I can tell you that from my perspective, even in this uh, forum, I think uh, a dedicated, uh, perhaps not uh, open uh, discussion, but uh, a close one, half a day or full day of uh, a workshop on dual use, I think in 2024 is, is much needed. I think uh, if, if I should give just one quick answer to the question that you didn't ask, uh, uh, I probably will say that uh, from space you see no boundaries. They shouldn't, we shouldn't build our own boundaries. Uh, what we sh must understand, that in order to build a sustainable space ecosystem, we need to partner with everyone that we can because space is still hard. So I guess the question is what we need to do. So we need to put no boundaries. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, more questions. So that, uh, this is a proof that uh, a further discussion is needed, uh, perhaps uh, later, uh, but not uh, on this panel because our time is up. So thank you very much to the distinguished uh, panelists and uh, see you on the next discussion. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the panel experts for their interesting views on new space, so thank you again. We talked a lot about space, and space is an expensive hobby, you may say. Our next session is a fireside chat on space investment in changing markets, led by Mr. Ely Cohen, Managing Director at Synergy Capital. Ely will talk with Mr. Chris Quilty, co-CEO and president of Quilty Space. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Oh. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli Cohen, and uh, I got Chris Quilty here with me. Thanks for uh, attending our session. Uh, we're gonna start with a little bit of introductions and really the topic of this discussion is all about the business of space from an investment standpoint, both in terms of how people invest in this market, be it private investments in private companies as well as public companies. Um, Chris, do you wanna say a few words of background about yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Quilty. I have been doing financial analysis on space companies for about 20 years. Uh, originally, my uh, first 20 years at an investment bank called Raymond James, where uh, when I started, I was the only analyst on Wall Street writing on the space industry. Uh, when I left in 2016 to start my own shop, I was the only analyst on Wall Street writing on the space industry. Um, that has changed, and the, the capital markets have changed dramatically in really the last five to seven years. Uh, and we work independently. I'm a, a small group of about 10 people. 
Uh, we do research, we do uh, in-depth uh, company research and technology research, and we do investment banking work in the space. And then again, I should note, we, I began my career focused on the public companies, but we kind of work throughout the capital stack with uh, private equity, venture capital, family offices. So we kind of take a full broad stream look at the, uh, the finance of the, of the space industry. My experience uh, includes many years in uh, venture capital as a partner in uh, local venture capital fund, uh, Magma Venture Partners, as well as uh, a number of years in mergers and acquisitions. I was heading uh, M&A for a few internationally traded Israeli companies, uh, Converse and then Gilad Satellite Networks, which is how I actually got into the uh, satellite and space uh, industry. In last... Uh, Years I've been working uh, a lot also in the areas of investment banking, helping companies uh, get sold, helping companies buy other companies, and also collaborating with uh, Chris and his uh, team. I think it's safe to say that beyond investments, uh, we were involved in mergers and acquisitions or growth financing for, I would say, most, if not all, the mid to large size companies in the local ecosystem. Uh, there aren't that many, uh, and we need more. Yeah. So maybe uh, we'll start uh, with talking a little bit about uh, current events. And certainly over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, hype and a rise in um, valuation and investments, a lot of interest in capital markets as well as private investments, uh, in investments in general and in space in particular. Uh, we've seen from a macro perspective, a number of uh, down points, both on the macroeconomical level globally, as well as here in Israel, uh, both political unrest as well as the recent events uh, with Gaza. Uh, Chris, maybe we'll start with this. How do you see uh, the local, as well as the international, maybe focus on the international side, uh, in light of uh, the events in the last uh, couple of years, as it relates to the space industry? Yeah, well, maybe starting local. I think the uh, the first time I came to Israel, you know, a decade or so ago, I think there were maybe about a half dozen companies here that uh, that we focused most of our energies on. Uh, I'm on the ground three days. I, we're probably seeing three dozen companies uh, on this trip. So, uh, and that's indicative of what we're seeing globally. Uh, we do track uh, startup activity, uh, you know, both domestically in the U.S. as well as globally. Uh, and there has been just a sea change. And there's really, I think, three things that have caused the current investment cycle we're seeing in the number of startups. You know, one is the cost of launch. That's the most important equation. When you shave a zero off the cost of launch, activities that you might think you want to do but don't make economic sense suddenly do. And that's why you're seeing this explosion of companies, you know, getting into things as you know, far off as asteroid mining or you know, lunar mining or uh, doing in-space refueling. Uh, these companies are getting funded, and lots of them today. I think we've got over 450 companies, funded companies we're tracking uh, in that sort of cis-lunar domain. So cost of launch was critical. You know, the other two things that have happened uh, that are important to the industry, the space industry is capital intensive. And, uh, you know, the sources of capital of how you could start up a company were fairly limited. Uh, we, we've had a handful of very important billionaires that have made their stake and, and made, their, you know, made it clear that they have an interest, most notably Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, that are not just, they're not investing in space. These are guys who believe the future is in space and they're putting their personal net worth towards it. Uh, but more importantly, the broader venture capital ecosystem has finally been opened up to the space industry. And to give you an idea of how dramatic it is, in the decade prior to 2015, there were nine space companies a year globally that were backed by venture capital. And it averaged about 140 million a year. Since 2015, we've seen hundreds of companies funded and on average about two to three billion dollars a year. That excludes the mega constellations. That doesn't include the 11 billion that Amazon spent on their launch contract. Uh, so that's talking about the smaller companies that are, you know, sort of the, the lifeblood and a lot of the innovation that's in the industry. And I tell you, the third and final thing that's happened that I think is absolutely critical, uh, in the space industry, you basically had one customer, which was the government. 
except for perhaps the SATCOM industry where you, you did have a commercial marketplace. And what we've seen, I think, dramatically in the U.S. is the government is now turning the keys over to the commercial operators and saying, we want commercial companies to do this. Um, I did a presentation yesterday and I highlighted that, you know, NASA as an administration that built hardware, they've gotten out of the business of doing crew and cargo delivery to the space station. They've outsourced that at fixed price. They're even doing fixed price contracts to take payloads to the moon and humans to the moon. And you're seeing the Department of Defense moving towards an open procurement system, building this uh, 500 satellite constellation, fixed price contracting, and it's dramatic. And it's creating huge opportunities for commercial companies you know, to, to both participate with government funding, but also to open up new venues of commercial growth. Chris, what are some of the um, hot topics or themes for investment in space these days? And also, who are the investors? Who are those entities, both on the private and public market side, that are investing and maybe haven't been investing before? Yeah, well, I already mentioned venture capital, so I won't delve into that. But, um, you know, what I would say is uh, we're seeing in the U.S. entire pools of government money made available for investing. There's uh, organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit that was set up to act as a, uh, a connecting point between Silicon Valley tech and the Defense Department. Uh, so that has become a, a huge area of growth. And oddly enough, uh, we're seeing even a lot of private equity players, uh, which typically, you know, you're talking about bo leveraged buyouts and mature companies and, you know, mergers and acquisitions, but there have been a number of companies, uh, probably the most notable one in the U.S., uh, AE Industrial Partners. Uh, they are a huge investor in Firefly, which is building integrated launch vehicles and landers. Uh, they also acquired and rolled up seven companies into a now public company called uh, Redwire. Um, and I would also note, you know, still in the earlier stages, you're now seeing commercial companies, uh, and I'm talking large multinationals, whether it's pharmaceutical companies that are trying to figure out how to manufacture in space, or whether it's uh, other companies that have, uh, you know, looking at lander technology and rovers and other ways that they can take, you know, their core terrestrial technology and apply it in space. So that's interesting. One of the uh, themes that I've seen uh, being more important now, and you mentioned AE Industrial Partners being essentially a defense-oriented investor. They are interested in the defense uh, theme. And as a theme, defense has never been something that uh, investors have been investing in, just given the governmental uh, aspect of that particular uh, industry. So we're seeing a lot more certification of defense-related uh, investments as something that are investable, so to speak. And I think also uh, recent uh, global trends such as the uh, war in Ukraine has highlighted, uh, have highlighted the importance of satellite and space as it relates to uh, new technologies and the importance of those technologies, not only in government, but also in uh, civilian related uh, um, investment uh, opportunities. So we see that here in Israel for sure. We have the uh, large defense integrators here like IAI and Rafael doing a lot more these days. But, uh, uh, but certainly defense has been uh, an important investment theme in the last couple of years. What, are, what other investment themes are you seeing? Well, you know, just to follow on on the, uh, the government aspect, that was typically an area that, you know, venture capitalists didn't want to get involved in, of, of getting in front of the government and regulatory environment. But, uh, you know, to give you an example, I, I was asked by a government agency to write a report about the future of space, and, you know, I identified some uh, critical technologies, and there were two that I said, hey, I think these are important, but I can't find any commercial application for them. And the two of them were active debris removal, sorry, astroscale, and, uh, and nuclear thermal propulsion. Well, guess what? Within a year of writing that report, astroscale got a contract from the Defense Innovation Unit, as did a company doing nuclear thermal propulsion. So there, you're seeing very targeted investments where the government is trying you know, to drive the commercial entities in a certain direction. What was your question? 
Yeah, so when, as it relates to Israel, um, how are you seeing the, um, I guess, progress of the industry here? And I also have a few thoughts about that as well. Yeah, I was going to ask that question to you, which, uh, okay. you know, we, we've been doing this for a while, uh, coming over and talking to companies. And as I mentioned, it's tremendous growth uh, in startups, a ton of innovation. Uh, it's one of the reasons I've, I've made it a habit of visiting over the years. Uh, Israel tends to box above its weight class in all things space. And, uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, with the Israeli Space Agency taking a, a stronger stance, uh, you know, and with the startup activity happening, you know, it's a tough capital environment. We haven't talked about that. You know, 2023, um, it's a, you, an English term called it sucked. Uh, it was a terrible year. I think the worst year since 2017 for capital raising. I mean, deal volume in Q4 was the worst in a decade. It was a tough year to raise capital. And that's coming off the back of 2020, the post-COVID, where the government flooded the market with capital and, and you saw this crazy SPAC phenomenon and whatnot. Uh, we're dealing with the after effects of that in the U.S. and the capital environment has become very tight. Are you seeing that in Israel? And, and where are companies going to find it? Yeah, so of course, macroeconomic uh, situation has an impact on Israel as well as our own uh, trouble, if you want to call it that way. But I, I want to talk about resilience because I think uh, today, the conference today, even the decision to do this conference today uh, at this time is all about resilience. And what we've seen since the downturn of the economical markets uh, last year, as well as through today, we're seeing resilience in the Israeli ecosystem. I think last year after the macroeconomic downturn, we still saw a number of large investments and show of confidence in local eco ecosystem. And I'm, I would like to uh, perhaps share a few uh, examples on that and all aspects of the of the market both on the upstream when you think about Ramon space being able to raise I think 26 million dollars. That's a great one yeah. um, Another one was CropEx that's downstream right an application for uh, precision agriculture 30 million dollar raise made some acquisitions. That's tremendous um, I also want to talk about tomorrow tomorrow IO an Israeli or Israel related uh, weather uh, system raised 80 million dollars. That's amazing. And now not only is it an application, they're having their own satellites. It's really extraordinary. And another one, maybe a final thought on that, we're seeing Israeli industry not just as sellers but also as buyers. And Gilad, Gilad Satellite Networks uh, in last year acquired a company in, um, in the U.S. Uh, defense market. Uh, that's great. Israeli companies are coming of age are growing, and I am optimistic about seeing a lot more of that in the coming uh, period. Yeah, and you did ask about other investment drivers uh, and growth drivers for the industry. It's hard to call this a driver more than a reaction, which is China. Uh, we are seeing tons of decisions in the U.S. made based upon how they are going to counter China. Uh, we're never gonna build another international space station. But because the Chinese have one, we need a solution. So what NASA's done is they've gone out and funded four companies, now three, because Northrop dropped out, to develop commercial space stations. And on the back of that investment, there's at least six companies that I know of that are, are not named, you know, those, those three primary with NASA that are also building space stations. Um, likewise, the U.S. Uh, investment in things like the, the $2.6 billion CLPS lunar program uh, yeah, they want to do some science, but they also want to get to those valuable regions of the moon uh, before China turns it into the Spratly Islands. So Chris, you go around, you see a lot of companies all over the world in the space uh, industry. We like to think of ourselves here in Israel as um, a country with a lot of potential for our space industry. We typically joke that we're the fourth company to crash a lander on the moon. Uh, that's not a bad accomplishment, oh. but... but uh, We've now seen India, as well as Japan, la land on the moon. What can a, a country that's not Japan, not the US, not Russia, not China in terms of resources, what does a middle-sized country, I would say Israel is not too small and certainly not too, too big, but an ecosystem of a country that's middle in its size of proportions, 
do, what are some of the case studies or the uh, interesting observations you have in other countries that have uh, an up-and-coming successful space ecosystem from the investment perspective? Yeah, so maybe I'll go uh, run the range, right? Which is at the bottom end, uh, you can build and launch a CubeSat and get it on orbit for three or four hundred thousand dollars, which was unimaginable, right? Ten years ago, ten years ago, you couldn't even at any cost you couldn't get the thing on orbit. You just couldn't get a launch vehicle. So again, back to the launch is really important. You know. Four times a year, you can jump on a SpaceX transporter mission for a known fixed price and get your satellite on orbit. So even small countries can invest in a technology that gets people excited, you know, kids, universities, academic, uh, to, to go out and test and be part of the space community. Um, then you have other models like, for example, uh, Great Britain, uh, which has put a huge investment into their Harwell Space Hub where they're attracting in companies. They've been putting in huge government subsidy for technology development, tax breaks, R&D breaks. Uh, and I had a US company that left me and went over to the UK uh, because they got a better deal. Um, and then at maybe the other end of it, you've got uh, countries like the UAE, which has, they have the money, you know, to make the, uh, the investments for doing big things. And I think we'll see some of the other uh, Middle Eastern countries, including Saudi Arabia, you know, is getting a little bit more uh, aggressive in their investment. And, uh, you know, look, there's a, a final interesting case study I can think of of a company like Luxem country like Luxembourg, uh, which doesn't have huge manufacturing capability or anything else, but you have a, a government entity that, you know, not only did they, through tax reasons, get, you know, the SESs and Intelsats of the world to, uh, to uh, uh, domicile there, uh, but they've also done a fantastic job of creating a space ecosystem, again, largely through tax and regulatory regimes. Uh, it's a bad bet, it was an early bet, but Luxembourg made themselves the space mining country. And so they've set up a regulatory regime that allows them, makes it a very attractive place for people that want to uh, you know, follow that, because there's a lot of challenging space law you gotta deal with. Uh, when you're going out and, and taking stuff from outer space and bringing it back. Yeah, I want to follow up on some of the case studies you provided. Certainly with Luxembourg, it was, uh, and I got to speak with the head of space, space agency there. It was a predetermined decision on their part to have the space, com uh, space economy a substantial part of what they do. And it's an amazing success story. It is now, I think, 1% of their GDP, which is astounding. So. Predetermination as well as uh, what I would call regulatory and taxation benefits have gotten them to that thing. The other thing is UAE and Middle East countries. I think certainly the Abraham Accords have opened the door and hopefully will continue to open the door for collaboration with Middle Eastern countries around such uh, uh, projects and such opportunities. And certainly uh, I know that the space agency here in Israel is uh, busy with that. Beyond that, I think Israel really has the seeds. What I mean by the seeds is we have the legacy. Israel was one of the first countries to build, launch, maintain uh, satellites in space. One of the few countries that did that. One of the first countries that did that. And if you take into consideration the amazing ecosystem we got here of the downstream side, the AI, the ML, the cyber, uh, the ability to know how to build, operate, finance, and then maybe sell or grow uh, technology companies. These two skills together are the grains of what's needed to do an amazing uh, space economy. And I think, uh, yeah, I think we still have a chance of uh, doing that with what we have around us. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you, Ilya and Chris. Our space uh, exploration is coming to an end with a final panel led by Ms. Emma Vardimon, Director of Global Partnerships at Startup Nation Central, titled Pivoting into Space, the boldly go where no one has gone before. This panel will, will lead a discussion about spin-offs into the space sec sector.
What causes a company to pivot from their market into the space sector? What changes are needed and how is it done? Miss Emma Vardimon, the stage is yours. So, we are the last panel. Thank you all for staying with us. Uh, we are a panel about uh, talking about the enablers. So I would like just to extend a personal thanks to our accessibility enablers. Yes, you are here. Thank you for translation to sign language. So it is undeniable that the space market is expanding in the last year above the traditional needs of satellite, GPS, and defense. For those companies who are looking to evaluate and adapt their product or their technologies, um, they need uh, the specific requirement of, of space. It's imperative to have facilitators uh, to help them and guide them to the hurdles of this journey. So we have a fantastic panel and I'm thrilled to invite you to join me on stage. First, uh, Roy Naor, CEO and co-founder of Creation Space. Uh, Dr. Doron Klepach from FVMAT, a startup pushing the boundaries of uh, metamaterial. Uh, Doron is the CEO and co-founder of FVMAT, along with uh, Yoav Hertig, who is uh, innovation uh, principal at uh, IAI, one of uh, Israel aerospace uh, powerhouse. And last but not least, Dr. Tsipi Shoham, CEO and co-founder of Greenonix, a food tech company, already testing and validating its product in space. So thank you all for being here. And uh, yeah, get your... Uh... <laughs> Let's dive into the discussions. So Roy, I'd like to start with you. And uh, if you can uh, give us in one sentence a bit more about uh, what is uh, creation space. Sure, you can hear me, great. So creation, creation Space is an innovation hub for startups and companies that develop technologies that are relevant for human and robotic space missions. Amazing. Uh, Doron, uh, can you explain a bit more about uh, you know, FVMAT's innovative technologies and its application? All right, uh, for, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, having us. Um, yes, so we develop uh, simulation and design tools for metamaterials. Metamaterials are materials with extraordinary multifunctional properties that are uh, being, in, being in, the, the way you produce them is by micro-engineering or nano-engineering the, the structure of them. Um, Basically, it's really hard to produce or develop these materials, and that's where we come in. So we work a lot on the simulation tools with AI so that the customer will have tools that it's easy and user-friendly in terms of the development. Uh, a couple of examples in optics, electromagnetism, um, mechanics, and... and uh, in heat transfer, we develop uh, shock absorbers or metal lens, for example. You, have, you are the innovation practice manager at IAI. Uh, can you please uh, give us a brief overview of your role there? Okay, hello, and thank you for having us. Um, IAI is a big company, Israel Aerospace Industries, and uh, the, the, I guess the emphasis is on aerospace, so it's both aero and space. And... Um, in, in the innovation practice, what we do is we have a, a three-tier approach. It's internal innovation, so we grow our own internal uh, inventions and startups. We work with external innovation, such as FVMAT, and uh, we work with startups, we work with universities. Um, uh, it's a elaborate activity. And then the third tier is uh, innovation, innovation culture, which is events, uh, all sorts of competitions, etc., to keep the innovation going inside the normal organization. So this is the practice. Great. Uh, TP Greenonix is a food tech company growing duckweeds. Uh, tell us about its application to space. It's interesting. 
So indeed, uh, we have developed a very unique agricultural platform. It's actually a whole supply chain under one roof that is fully automated. It's a line of robots that are doing their jobs, and it's highly efficient and, uh, eco and uh, at low cost. Uh, we are growing duckweeds, which is uh, plants that have been marked by NASA for many, many years as the potential crop for space. And it's just natural that we are also aiming with our technology uh, to space, um, aligning, perfectly aligning with the needs for compact solution, highly efficient and cost effective. Great, thank you. So I'm going back to you, Roy. Um, how do you enable companies to breach their technology or their product into space application at uh, Creation Space? Well, Creation Space is composed of a team of um, experts in a variety of space-related fields. We work with, with startups, but we also work with uh, large companies and governmental organizations. Uh, we are helping them develop space-related innovation hubs and testing sites. Um, we start by identifying the match between a problem in a human or robotic space mission, uh, matching it with a terrestrial solution. Then we provide our expertise, helping them with their engineering and research um, in order to modify the product uh, so it can be, so it can serve its applicability, the, sorry, the applicability for Earth and space. Then, uh, eventually, we help with commercializing the product. Uh, we, can, we either uh, help them apply for non-dilutive funds, like grants, uh, and we can also help them with private funding, either through Creations VC, which is the American fund that uh, backing us, or other sources. Very versatile. It's great that each time that I have an interaction with you, I understand a little bit more what you're doing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, Doron, uh, simple question, why space? How did you make the decision to look and to adapt the technology for uh, the space sector? So, um, the, the materials, the metamaterials that we're developing, they're complicated. It takes a long time to develop them. It's expensive. And the space industry, uh, they're early, early adopters of novel technology and, and they're interested in cutting edge technology. So it was basically a, a kind of a very easy match or an easy connection to make with the, that industry. Um, and it's, you know, what we do is, is of high interest to them. So it was natural. Okay. And you have, you are the one that is uh, working along with uh, Doron on uh, this application. What is the potential did you see in leveraging FVMAT uh, technology for the aerospace industries? And, uh... Okay, one of the things we do is we always look for what we call disruptive technologies. Disruptive can be on many levels. In Doron case, it's really on the basic level of uh, enabler, enabling the, the further development of, of applications. So applications for me could be uh, something mechanical, could be something uh, electromagnetical, could be many types of applications. So in my role as, as innovation practice, I was looking for the disruptive basic enabler which drone brings and they develop the ability to simulate and to test uh, the metamaterials, which is kind of a buzzword now in the industry. And uh, so we brought them in for one specific application. I can't elaborate what, but it's a, an interesting application. But then it actually spread for other applications because of their ability to simulate and to actually create, a, to, to create a, the, the infrastructure to work and develop. So, and I, actually after today, there's a few other ideas, a few other introductions I need to make for them. <laughs> so there's, uh, that, that's what we do. Great. So uh, even with the, the interaction between you and the collaboration, you already are able to, to move forward to other, uh, maybe new sector and new application. And that. Yeah. yeah, it's a big company and once you put one foot in and it can start spreading in. Going yeah. many directions. 
TP, you told us uh, you're really the one that is coming the, the farthest from what we call, you know, space technology as your, your food tech company. And you told us a little bit about uh, the duckweed that you're growing. But uh, um, I think that um, what other benefits, uh, you know, your product is to space? We talked a little bit about it being a superfood, but I know there are other also uh, maybe uh, benefits uh, from, uh, from the cultivation of uh, the duckweeds. So, um, in Greenonics, we are talking about securing the fresh factor uh, in our nutrition. Uh, we are used to industrialized food. Uh, we are not eating as much as we need uh, fresh quality. And it's the same for the astronauts. Um, and even more, I think, um, the lack of the fresh factor. And we have been reported that we have seen that astronauts are really suffering from um, uh, reduced well-being, uh, mentally and physically, as a result that they are not eating fresh food. We have developed uh, the ultimate solution for them. Um, first, on, based on a miniature cultivation system that can grow fresh vegetables in space, in the, first in the International Space Station, but then in other space journeys. And we also developed a very nice package that can be can ship um, send fresh produce from Earth to space for the astronauts, so we can incorporate fresh vegetables into their daily diet. So we have just uh, launched um, an experiment uh, months ago, um, ascending a miniature cultivation system for growing duckweeds uh, in space. And it was very nice to see how they grow, how they survive uh, very nicely in the microgravity conditions, in the ambient uh, space environment. And we also send fresh uh, produce, fresh duckweeds, we call them wanna greens, mm. uh, in our unique pouch that they could uh, squeeze and uh, try. And uh, it's really nice uh, to realize that our vegetable can survive the, the trip, the, mission, the launch, and reach there alive and fresh and vibrant and bring fresh nutrition to their diet. Great. So leveraging uh, innovation uh, demands uh, collaboration, of course, and we're talking about that a little bit. And, uh, Doron, when you look back at you know, your relationship with IAI from inception, uh, what do you feel has contributed to making it a successful collaboration as a you know, small startup engaging with a large corporation? So I think there were two main uh, topics. One was that we have a really good rela relationship with, with uh, Yoav. Uh, he was guiding us and mentoring us throughout the, the collaboration and he was open and willing to bridge any gap that was needed or necessary. Um, the other thing was that IAI recognized that we're a startup. So they were able to leverage our agility and our quick way of doing things, but they did not, or they did not provide us with too much bureaucracy. So they were working really well with us. That's the main, main factor. Okay. And you, you have, if I'm asking for the second, uh, the second, you know, side of the mirror, uh, when you're looking back, what expectation did you have of uh, Evima to make this partnership uh, successful? How they should adapt? Okay, I'll, I'll give it to two parts. First of all, from our part, the expectation that we try to, to portray on the other side, uh, what we have, we have a, an, we established an accelerator. So I have now have actually a few of them. And this is how we managed to somehow cut down bureaucracy. Not a lot, but it's quite significant. And because we can be a government-owned company, we can be fairly bureaucratic. Um, so that's what on how do we come across to the startup more as easier to work with. On the other hand, the, from the other side, it's, it's all about, I think, expectations, what you build. It's like, you know, real estate is about location, location, location. Here it's expectations, expectations, expectations. <laughs> it's what you, ex what, you need to build the right level of expectation from what you do with the startup. Uh, you need to allow yourself for some leeway of success, not success, uh, retries. Uh, and I must say, we built the, uh, together with Doron, we built the right level of expectation. We actually exceeded that expectations. We delivered 
uh, we, we created a really good um, working relationship. And with that, that could work both ways. And that can be the next step for, that could be the base for the next step. So we created something. It doesn't necessarily, as an innovation, I don't expect to succeed or actually implement everything, but we created the base level, and from there it's ongoing. Great. So we're talking about collaboration between the companies, but there's also collaboration with the ecosystem, I guess. And Roy, I know that uh, I'd be happy if you can tell us about the hub that you are developing in Mitzperamon in Israel. Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so as, as I said, we are developing a space-related innovation hub, so I can already share that we started uh, developing such an innovation hub for the township of Mitzperamon. Uh, that's the city of space in Israel. That's the city that has the most, uh, the largest amount of space-related activities or institutes per capita in Israel, uh, and the city tries to brand itself for, ma for many years. So uh, our, our, um, uh, our support in them is I'm to bring, uh, to open new jobs uh, in the Negev and bring entrepreneurs and experts to the south. The, the, we chose uh, to work with Mitzperamon not just because of uh, uh, its branding, but also because of the environment. Uh, the arid environment of the desert and of uh, Ramon Crater, which I think that by now many people agree that uh, it is, uh, a, a, I would say, world-known analog environment for the Martian environment. And that's the reason why we are focusing there also on developing a testing, testing site, field testing site facility. Uh, Doron, uh, if we're talking about the integration uh, to space, what space-specific computational adaptation did you have to make uh, for FEMAT? Well, the good news is that we didn't have to start from scratch. We have an infrastructure and a methodology. But um, when it comes to space, there are specific applications that you need to take into account the, difference in the different environment and surroundings. For example, microgravity or no gravity or no atmosphere. So that required it requires us to rebuild or remodel our, our specific models and create a new database. It's, um, I'd say, it's not, as I said, it's not from scratch, but it is uh, not a, you know, an epsilon. It's not just a little uh, addition. It's a major addition in, in our um, modeling or our products, let's say. And you have, do you play, what is the, the role did you play, the, um, the key role did you play with FVMAT regarding the adaptation of the technology to your needs, to the needs of uh, aerospace? In this, in this specific way, we, we, in this specific instance, we actually chose the application, and the adaptation is per application. So the basic physics doesn't change. It's the, the same physics on Earth and in space, and the, the, what we call the, the, the conditions or the, the boundary conditions change. But the basic physics remains, and uh, in our case, it's a basic simulation for a basic uh, definition of, of the problem, and that's what defines the, the way it works. I remember in our prep discussion, they said that if the methodology is strong, then there is a good chance to, to advance and to make it uh, happen. If, uh... Correct. Great. So, Tipi, you have a uh, deeper experience with green onyx. Uh, as it was already tested in space, and now you're looking for uh, the next step. Uh, can you tell us more about your journey also to get there, and what were the key partnership and lesson learned from that? Sure, so we, um, we collaborated with Nanorex uh, in order to ship our miniature lab uh, to the uh, International St uh, Space Station uh, via the SpaceX uh, cargo mission. Um, we have followed uh, the Duckwitz plants uh, for their ability to grow for several weeks. Um, we used our uh, proprietary um, control system to follow them, to video them, and uh, we are happy to share that they grew wonderfully. Um, they are unique uh, creatures. They are the tiniest vegetable on Earth, and uh, based on their unique structure, they are the perfect match for 
growing in microgravity condition and also in a very, very high carbon dioxide uh, concentration. I don't know if you are aware, but there is above 2,000 ppm concentration of carbon dioxide in the ISS, uh, which is like fourfold of what we have on Earth. Um, and they just co op wonderfully with that condition. And uh, growing vegetables in space is actually a um, perfect uh, measure to transform carbon dioxide to oxygen because that's what plants do. So it's really, really good news that uh, they did a job, um, although in small scale, but we can grow from there. In addition, uh, we realized that we can indeed ship from Earth to space our fresh produce. They remain fresh. Uh, because they are still alive, these tiny vegetables, uh, they can survive several weeks under controlled condition as we have in the package. So they can arrive per perfectly fresh and at high, high quality for the astronauts uh, to be uh, incorporated in their diet. So next step is to uh, study further how we can develop and adapt our technology to the space conditions and uh, develop the uh, cultivation system and uh, hopefully start some uh, trials with the astronauts to follow the impact on their uh, well-being. So uh, also improving your uh, product on Earth after testing it in space is uh, allowing you... Uh... Yes, we, uh, we are very excited to uh, receive back plants that have been born in space, so it's enable us to follow them and study if there are some differences, if there are all kinds of... <laughs> uh, but uh, they look very nice and uh, they grow nicely and um, uh, we hope to uh, continue from here. Roy, from your perspective, uh, what are the main challenges in commercializing, you know, space-related technologies? It's well, not easy. Uh, I would it's not have an to easy say, task. Yeah, <laughs> I would have to say the market. Uh, for many of these space-related technologies, the, the market in the space sector is only starting to grow. This is why we always select uh, to work with developments that can also present a strong potential market for its terrestrial application. Okay, so as we conclude, before we conclude, then each one will give us, uh, you know, uh, some of this conclusion. Uh, we're left with a glimpse into the future where cutting-edge technology and established expertise converge to shape the next frontier of space exploration. Uh, I liked very much the, the sentence say here before from uh, really science fiction to space exploration. It's really a great one. I'm going to steal it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Doron and you, have, what, what closing reflection do you have about space sector collaboration, the importance of... Uh... Um, in my opinion, uh, if a large uh, company or, or uh, um, I don't know, agency is interested in working with startups, I think it has a huge potential uh, of kind of winning from both worlds, meaning those uh, companies have, you know, infrastructure and a lot of abilities, uh, whereas startups ha do not have those, but they have the agility or the, the kind of open-minded, you know, way of doing things. So it can be a win-win situation. So space collaboration. <laughs> uh, Future, yeah. Yeah, the, look, the, the, we are a definition of AI is a system integrator. So we integrate system from all sources, so mostly our own subcontractors, and the subcontractors could be as big and small. So from our point of view, this is business as usual. You know, we are always looking for partners. We're always looking for uh, new technologies to integrate into our system. So the question is where the market is eventually, is, you know, in space, in aerospace, uh, and wherever it is, we're quite happy to bring our partners with us. Uh, I think this is the case. Uh, this is the, the essential thing is the partnering. So once you get that right, it's space or aerospace. So partnership, collaboration, the guidance of a larger company uh, to the smaller one also, and also the capacity also uh, to have uh, some kind of uh, people that are enabling uh, the, the collaboration. 
Uh, TP, in closing, what is the one message you would like to share with startups that are looking, you know, to make the, the leap toward the space sector, that are outside of the sector and are looking into it? I think that if you find uh, cross-pollination between the business opportunities on Earth and in space, it's the perfect uh, scenario, it's the perfect case. Um, I think that there, there can be huge synergy uh, between the efforts, as in our case, uh, we were aiming originally for agriculture that can face constraints of resource availabilities, like we are uh, going to face in the future more and more. Uh, we need, even on Earth, compact and resilient and uh, uh, cost-efficient agriculture. It's the same uh, for space. So space studies actually serve perfect ground for us to uh, push our technology and to push our studies even further to the benefits of both opportunities. So if startups can identify this synergy, I would, I would suggest go there. Great. So Roy, let's, uh, let's close with you. How do you see the future for agents such as yourself, you know, opening the space sector of outsider? synergies, collaboration, partnership, I guess also the market is uh, important. Well, humanity is on its way back to the moon and eventually to Mars. And this endeavor holds a great opportunity for uh, new technological developments that can help humanity here on Earth, similar to uh, the effect of the Apollo missions. Uh, so this is why this sector is exponentially growing, and we are here to make an impact. Great. So thank you all for joining us today and for sharing also your experience and your thoughts about uh, the future of uh, commercialization of uh, space endeavors. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That tonight's gonna be a good night. I'd like to thank the participants of the panel and Emma for an interesting discussion. With this, we conclude the 19th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. I want to thank you for being part of this enriching experience and led the discussions, insights and collaborations we had today propel us towards new heights in space explore, exploration and innovation. We welcome you next year to the 20th Ilan Ramon International Space Conference. See you next year and right now I extend an invitation and to join us for networking outside this hall. Thank you so much.